Incredible. Good. Fantastic. Well, it's a great pleasure to continue, and in fact, with a wonderfully provocative title from Sue Fratz, and hopefully a lively discussion to follow. Anyway, Sue, thank you for joining us and giving us this talk on the structure and asking whether whether structure is required at the horizon to resolve the information paradox. Thanks. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Nick and Yusuf, for organizing this conference. And I've had a, a great time so far in all the discussions and listening to the talks. Uh, so my talk today is going to be uh, based on, a, uh, on some work that I've been doing over the past few years. Uh, I'm largely going to talk about this uh, last paper I wrote with uh, Alok, Siddharth, uh, and Pushkal. Uh, but I'll also make reference to some earlier work and also some work in progress uh, with uh, Chandramoli, Olga, and Kiriakos. So uh, let me just start by with the motivation. Uh, I think in this, uh, in this conference, uh, we've had uh, many, many discussions uh, so far uh, on uh, the idea that one should identify uh, degrees of freedom on different parts uh, of a nice slice. Uh, and uh, this idea has been around for some time. In some sense, it's a very old idea. In the more recent discussions, uh, it's something that, that, that many people, many of us worked on, including Kiriakos and me, and Eric and Herman, and then uh, Juan and Lenny, and uh, going on in a sense to the more recent island proposals. And the reason this idea is important uh, for the, the topic of the conference is that I think if we could establish uh, this idea, uh, then I think we could resolve the information paradox with no need uh, for structure at the horizon. So, so what my objective in this talk today is going to be to try and make uh, this, this picture that I just described uh, precise in asymptotically flat space. Uh, and I'm also going to try and explain, I know there was a lot of discussion yesterday about where these effects come from. Uh, and I'm going to try and explain the origin of this picture uh, from semi-classical physics. Uh, and it's going to be a somewhat a different approach uh, to the approach that we heard about uh, in the talks yesterday, uh, because in particular, I will not invoke uh, either the Ryu-Takanagi formula uh, or the Euclidean uh, path integral. So it's going to be a complementary approach uh, on a similar kind of problem. Uh, uh, just to advertise what I think the consequences uh, of uh, this result will be that I hope to establish by the end of the talk, uh, I would like to argue that, that one can make this picture precise and this picture does provide a natural resolution to the information paradox without horizon microstructure. Uh, and I would like to especially address the question of how this avoids uh, the small correction theorem uh, that Samir uh, articulated uh, so nicely in his talk. Uh, and I'd also like to make some contact with some of the talks yesterday. In particular, uh, while the picture I'm suggesting is also the one that was discussed uh, previously in previous talks, uh, I would like to emphasize the fact that this picture I'll try and develop in today's talk uh, suggests that information is always available outside the black hole horizon for suitably complicated measurements, even before the black hole has evaporated. And this, in a sense, is, is different from what was previously discussed. Uh, let me just try and explain uh, what I'd like to prove a little more precisely. Uh, what I'd like to prove is, is the following. Uh, you see, we know that in, in flat space, uh, if one looks at massless particles, uh, then without any additional assumptions, just from the fact that the theory is described by an S matrix, uh, we know that all information about massless particles can be obtained either on future null infinity, which is this, this thing on top, this line on top, or past null infinity. Uh, what I am going to try and establish in this talk is that in a theory of gravity, in fact, all information is available in a small neighborhood of the past boundary of future null infinity. And that's this little red region here. Uh, Similarly, all information is also available in the, near the future boundary of, of past null infinity, and that, that would be a region here. Uh, but I'm not going to make statements about past null infinity because everything is analogous. Also, uh, I've been a little lazy, and I'm going to draw two-dimensional uh, diagrams everywhere. Uh, but you should remember that you know uh, the Penrose diagram, if you were to really draw it, uh, looks a little bit like this figure on the right. And so what I'm going to argue is that when you look at future null infinity, which is this, this cone on top, uh, all the information is available near this little red boundary, this little red region uh, near its past boundary. Okay, uh, now the first thing, of course, you might ask me is, you know, how is uh, this result uh, related uh, to the previous idea that I described uh, of trying to, uh, you know, uh, relate degrees of freedom on a nice slice? And so the first thing I'd like to do uh, is to make that relationship clear. 
Uh, you see, if you had a local quantum field theory in flat space, and you thought about an event in, in the middle of flat space where you set up the origin of coordinates, which is described by this blue dot, uh, then information about that event is only available on these magenta parts of future null infinity. In particular, if you look at some region here, which is near the past boundary of future null infinity, the operator that creates uh, this event uh, commutes with the operators near the past boundary in a local quantum field theory. And so uh, the information would only be available in these uh, regions in the future. Uh, what I'm going to try and claim is that in gravity, the same information is also available uh, near the past boundary of future null infinity. And since it's available here, and you could also use the equations of motion to you know, obtain the same information from the magenta slices, I'm going to try and argue that the operators in these magenta segments here should be identified with a combination of operators in these short red segments uh, over here. And so this, in a way, is, the, is, is I think, the right approach uh, to make the previous idea precise rather than working on a space like slice where you have to worry about fixing gauge and identifying the location of operators. We work at null infinity, and there you can make this idea precise that you need to identify uh, different operators on the same slice. Okay, uh, so the, the precise setting uh, that I'm going to consider uh, is going to be a four dimensional asymptotically flat theories uh, with massless particles, where I'll try and establish this result. Uh, if I were to use ADS boundary conditions, I would have been able to make similar arguments in arbitrary dimensions and also in the presence of massive particles. Uh, but our world is closer to 4D flat space. And so it's more fun to talk about 4D flat space, even though we can make slightly weaker statements and we have to avoid talking about massive particles. And so that's the, the setting I'll, I'll, I'll talk about. Uh, before I, I start the technical part of my talk, uh, let me also say a little bit about the philosophy that I'm going to adopt in this talk. Uh, so the philosophy that I'm, I'm going to, when I said that I'll try and uh, understand these effects from the semi-classical theory, uh, the philosophy that I'm going to try and adopt in this talk is that we start by observing some interesting properties of the semi-classical theory, and then we make some precise assumptions about the full ultraviolet theory of quantum gravity, and we make some assumptions that it shares some specific low energy properties of the semi-classical theory, which I'll describe. And these assumptions allow us to extrapolate our results uh, from the semi-classical theory uh, to the full UV theory. In particular, I would like to clarify that at no point in this talk am I making a claim uh, that the semi-classical theory of gravity is UV complete by itself. That would be an absurd claim, which I'm not trying to make. Uh, rather, the claim is that the semi-classical theory of gravity already has robust lessons uh, to teach us about how quantum information is stored in the theory of quantum gravity and that we should take those lessons seriously. Okay. Uh, so that was my, my, my motivation and advertisement. Uh, I, I made a number of claims and now I need to justify them. Uh, so let me start by, by just, just discussing and reviewing a few elementary uh, aspects of four dimensional asymptotically flat space times. Of course, there are many, I'm sure there are many experts in the audience, but there are also probably people who don't uh, work on these issues. And so I'm going to just review some, some things that are well understood. Uh, so I'm going to consider four dimensional space time. It's convenient, uh, this is asymptotically flat. Of course, you could have whatever in the interior, including black holes or something else. Uh, we choose Bondi gauge uh, near, near null infinity. Uh, and then uh, you can write the metric in terms of the leading part of the metric, which is just Minkowski space and then subleading terms. Uh, so these subleading terms define for you what the fall off conditions on the metric are. Uh, there are going to be some important uh, dynamical quantities uh, that some of which have to do with the metric themselves. Uh, in particular, uh, this uh, quantity CAB is sometimes called the shear and it's a component of the metric. And it's often convenient uh, to speak not in terms of the shear itself, but rather in terms of the derivative of the shear with respect to retarded time. And that object is called the Bondi news. And you can think of it as the dynamical graviton operator at null infinity. Uh, it'll also be convenient for us uh, to talk about the Bondi mass, uh, which is the integral of this Bondi mass aspect MB that appeared in this part of the metric. Uh, the thing that's going to be important for us is to realize that when you take U to minus infinity, uh, which is where in our conventions, the past boundary of future null infinity is, uh, when U goes to minus infinity, this Bondi mass becomes the ADM mass. So it's just measuring the total amount of energy uh, in, the, in, in the space time. 
Uh, there are similar boundary conditions uh, you could put for matter fields. Uh, for instance, if you had a massless scalar field, you would put some one over R boundary conditions. And then we'll be interested in the part after stripping off that one over R, which I'll call O. Okay. Uh, now, uh, Ashtekar uh, found a very nice property of asymptotically flat spaces that in a sense makes them uh, in some sense nicer, but in some sense also more complicated uh, th than ADS. And uh, the nice uh, thing that Ashtekar found was that if you take the full nonlinear theory, uh, the full theory of general relativity, uh, then this full theory of general relativity uh, trivializes uh, on future null infinity. And in particular, you can use this to quantize the theory and you have some exact commutation relations you can you can compute. These are not commutation relations in the in the free theory or in the free approximation, but these commutation relations between the Bondi news and the shear you see here are just exact commutation relations in the full theory. And uh, you can also compute some constraints. Uh, so you might have thought that gravity becomes weak at null infinity, and that's true, of course. Uh, but there is uh, some analog or some remnant of the Gauss constraints that remains. And the remnant that remains is that the Bondi mass is related uh, roughly to the stress tensor of matter and gravity. And so if you integrate the stress tensor, that tells you about the Bondi mass. So, Rat, I have a question. How did yes. the Bondi mass, how did the NAB and CMN become operators? I mean, you know, before they're just some functions of, uh, of U and omega, how, how did they become operators? Why do they so you, need to- You have these Poisson brackets and you quantize the theory. But how do I get Poisson brackets to begin with? You know, and NAB is just a function of U and- Oh, uh, the Poisson yeah. brackets come by just taking the action of general relativity and computing the symplectic form and then pushing that symplectic form out to future null infinity. So you just take, I mean, you just take the Cherenkovich witten symplectic form and push it to null infinity. Maybe, I mean, this was before the Cherenkovich witten paper. You just take the symplectic form and push it to null infinity and you'll get these Poisson brackets. Okay. Okay. Okay, now there's something uh, that, 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 that we've, we've, uh, we knew, but we've, we've, learned, we've learned to appreciate more in the past few years, uh, a lot due to the work of Strominger and collaborators. Uh, and that is the fact that this theory has an infinite number of what are called super translation charges. Uh, the super translation charges are taken by taking this Bondi mass aspect near the past boundary of future null infinity and just integrating it with various kinds of spherical harmonics. Uh, there is one charge which is going to be of special interest, which is the charge when I don't have a spherical harmonic at all. I just integrate the Bondi mass and that, as I said previously, uh, is the Hamiltonian. And of course, there are many other charges, super infinity of other super translation charges. And one can use the constraints I showed previously uh, to break these charges up into what's called a soft charge, which is this term, and a hard charge, which is this term. Uh, so the soft charge, as will become evident, will label the vacua, uh, while the hard charges correspond to the super translation charges of excitations on top of the vacua. Okay, now, as I said, uh, uh, one thing we've, we've, learned, uh, we've learned to appreciate more is that the vacuum in four dimensional flat space is infinitely degenerate. And in fact, you could classify the different vacua by the eigenvalues under these super translation charges. And given a particular soft vacuum, uh, you can build a full Fox space on top of that vacuum by acting with the news operators and also with these matter field operators and any other massless fields you have in the theory. And that gives you the usual construction of a Fox space on top of a vacuum. And then once you have this Fox space on top of a particular vacuum, you take the direct sum of all of these Fox spaces, and that gives you what I will call the full Hilbert space of massless particles. And this is just the standard construction. Uh, all the statements I'm going to make are going to be confined uh, to this Hilbert space. And as I said previously, it excludes massive excitations, although I think the lessons that we learn will go on to massive excitations as well. Okay, uh, one more piece of notation I need to introduce. Uh, I'm going to discuss the algebra of asymptotic operators in null infinity. So for instance, you could take null infinity and look near this, this blue region, and you could take the Bondi mass and the shear and multiply them together in all possible ways. And the same way as you do in other places in quantum field theory, you would get an algebra. And this algebra is what I'll call AU. I'm going to be particularly interested in the limit of this algebra as you go to the pass boundary, which is the algebra that lives near the short red segment, which is just a set of all observables that you can make near the past boundary of future null infinity. So this algebra, you should think, if you don't want to think of algebras, you should just think of it as a shorthand for all the observations that an observer near the past boundary can make. And that's what I'm going to call A minus infinity. So Vrat, can I ask yes. one question? <clears throat> yes, yes. 
So, <clears throat> so here you multiply quantum operators. <clears throat> But the theory is not normalizable. So how do you know the space is um, well defined? So these operators are actually acting on a Fox space. And, and the second thing is I, 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 I ensured that, you know, these operators were always separated. So, you know, I'm separating them by some distance and then I'm multiplying together. But as I said, you know, in some sense, uh, the, the system is simpler because we have a Fox space at null infinity in which we multiply things. So you would be, you know, you're right. You would have to worry a lot about, you know, taking these operators and pushing them into the bulk where, uh, where uh, interactions are important. Uh, but one of the nice things about null infinity is that, you know, you just, it's, it's a free theory, it's subject to some constraints. And so if you keep the operators well separated, I don't see a problem. So you will never have to deal with operators which collide with each other. I beg your pardon? So you will never have to deal with the cases where the operators collide with each other. You never have to deal with the operators. Uh, that's a question. Do, do, you, do you, is the statement that they're always going to be uh, separated? Um, yes, they'll, they'll they'll always be separated. I'm not going to I'm not going to combine these operators together. Okay. No, yeah. Yeah. Thank you. N nothing I say will depend on taking these operators together and worrying very much about short distance limits. Just just a comment on that. Aren't you going to time evolve on Sky Plus? Isn't isn't that going to evolve uh, things no. overlapping? I'm not going to time evolve. I mean, I'm going to time evolve in that there's some abstract time evolution, which is what these U coordinates comes from, but I'm not going to at any point have any time evolution. Okay. I'm not going to put an E to the IHD. Uh, you will see. Okay. So the result I, I now want to show is that uh, any two distinct states uh, in this Hilbert space of massless particles, which are states in this Fox space, or direct sum of these Fox spaces, can be distinguished by this set of observables in what I call A minus infinity. Okay, so that's the result that I, I want to show for the purpose of this talk. Okay, so, so what is the strategy to show this result? Uh, there are going to be two steps in this proof, and I apologize that this is slightly technical, but very soon we will go through the technical part, and then I'll try and say more physical and intuitive things. Uh, but le let me just try and give you the, 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 the proof as concretely as I can. Uh, the first step in the proof is that I'm going to show that the Hilbert space uh, that I discussed previously uh, can actually be generated by the action of operators from A minus infinity on the various vacua. So, you know, earlier I generated the Hilbert space by acting with news operators on all of null infinity. And I'm going to say, well, if you decided to act with operators just in that little region near its past boundary, you would get the same Hilbert space. Uh, the second step is going to be uh, to note that gravity and semi-classical gravity tells us that the projectors onto the various vacua uh, live in this, in this, in this algebra. And then I'm going to combine these two results and I'm going to get, get the, the result that I want. Okay, so let me, let me, let me go through the first step, which is the, the question of squeezing the Hilbert space. I want to emphasize that this first step is, is not special to gravity. You could have done it in a local quantum field theory, even though it's surprising, it's a true result even there. Uh, so what I want to show is that, as I said, I started with a soft vacuum and then I generated a, a big Fox space by acting with these matter operators or news operators smeared with various functions, H1 to HM, which to start with had support over all of null infinity. And now I'm going to say, well, actually you could, you could just take these functions and make them have support only from minus infinity to some minus one over epsilon. It is important that there's a minus one over epsilon. And I'm going to say, well, you would get, you'd get the same Hilbert space. And what that precisely means is that this new Hilbert space is dense in the earlier Hilbert space. Uh, so the proof uh, goes by contradiction. Uh, let's say there was a state that belonged to this top line and that did not belong to the second line and that it was orthogonal to all states you could get from the second line. Okay. So you, there was some state which you could get by acting with operators in the larger region, but not by operators in the smaller region. If so, then consider this correlation function. Once again, all points are separated uh, and uh, consider this correlation function, which is the inner product of this state uh, with the action of these, these O's uh, when these U coordinates are in the regime minus infinity to minus one over epsilon and consider this inner product. By assumption, since this state psi is orthogonal to all states you could get by acting with these O's in this little region, uh, this correlation function is always zero. But we know something else about this correlation function. And that is that if we assume that the, the in the full theory, uh, the Hamiltonian is positive, then this correlation function is an analytic function of the differences of the retarded times that appear inside this correlation function. Uh, and because it's an analytic function, uh, you know that if it vanishes for UI in this region, then in fact, using standard theorems and complex analysis, uh, you, are, you can argue that it must therefore vanish for all real UI. 
but that's in contradiction with the assumption that the state psi perpendicular was actually an element of the original Hilbert space, since that Hilbert space was also generated by acting with similar operators, but for arbitrary values of u. And so that tells you that such a psi perpendicular cannot exist. Okay, so now this is a result that I showed that that's true in the semi-classical theory. It's true, as I said, in any quantum field theory in, in, in asymptotically flat space and also in, in particular in, in gravity. Uh, and now what I'm going to assume is that the Hamiltonian remains positive in the full ultraviolet theory of quantum gravity. I can't prove that assumption, but I'll assume it. Uh, this is much, much weaker than any energy condition. It's a statement about the full Hamiltonian. Uh, that's what I needed for the analyticity condition previously. And if I'm allowed to assume this, then what we have shown is that even in the full theory, uh, any state uh, can be, which is part of this, this Hilbert space that's obtained by acting on, the, on a particular soft vacuum, can actually be obtained by acting with an element of this smaller algebra on the soft vacuum. Okay, the second step in the proof, and this is the part where gravity is important, uh, is the following. Uh, since the Hamiltonian in particular is an element of the small algebra, the Hamiltonian, remember, was just the bondy mass as you went, as you went to minus infinity. Uh, the standard property of operator algebras tells you that all spectral projectors of the Hamiltonian are also in this little algebra. In particular, I'm interested in the projector onto all vacua. So of course the Hamiltonian has arbitrary projectors that can project onto any energy you like. I'm interested in the projector onto states of zero energy, which projects onto all of these soft vacua. Uh, so I said, I said this in some, in some abstract sense that you know, if you have an operator, you have all its spectral projectors as part of the algebra. But in fact, this projector onto the vacua is a very physical quantity. And you can, you, I can describe how you would act with it physically. If you had a state psi and you wanted to measure the expectation value of this projector in that state, uh, what you would do is you would measure H, uh, just use the standard rules of quantum mechanics, and you would count how many times you got zero and how many times you got something else. And that would tell you what the expectation value of this P omega is. So it's a pretty physical quantity, but even if you wanted to take a more rigorous approach, uh, this is a quantity that lives in the algebra. Okay, now the super translation charges are also elements of this algebra. Uh, and uh, because they're elements of the algebra, you can also project onto specific values of the super translation charges. And by combining the projector on the super translation charges and this projector on the vacuum, you can project onto a specific soft vacuum. And as I said, physically, you can act with this operator on a state by using a measure, the standard measure and discard procedure in quantum mechanics. You make a measurement of the super translation charges and then a measurement of the Hamiltonian, and you discard whenever you don't get the value zero for this last measurements and the value SLM for these other measurements. And this is the part which is very special to gravity. Uh, the fact that you can actually select a specific vacuum from the boundary of the space time from near the boundary of, of the slice of null infinity is a unique feature of gravity and it would not be true in any other theory. Okay, so now I have to assume something about the full theory. What I said is a, is a true property of the semi-classical theory of gravity. And what I'm going to assume in the full theory is that the vacua in the full theory continue to be labeled by operators near the past boundary of future null infinity. And as I said, this is just manifestly true in the semi-classical theory. There has been some discussion in the literature on, on soft theorems that you might need additional charges to label these vacua, but this assumption can account for that provided all of these charges are defined near the past boundary of future null infinity, which I think is true for any, 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 any uh, reasonable uh, charge that we expect to label the vacuum. Uh, the second assumption I need to make is that yeah, some of the I low energy- about that. So, if, so suppose my state is, has a D1, D5, P black hole in the middle of it. Yes. That, and in the initial state, it's uh, BPS. Yes. So it's not radiating, it's just sitting there. Yes. It seems like it came in not from future, uh, from, from uh, uh, you know, null infinity, but it was sitting there at time like past infinity and propagating up to time like future infinity. So where is the data in the Hilbert space you're talking about that tells me which of the D1, D5, P BPS black holes I had? In the initial state. Okay, thank you. So, is this is it is is your is your state like a stable massive particle in the theory that starts at past null infinity and goes up to future uh, past you time? You can think like of infinity. it that way. Yes. Yes, that it's not not there in the theory, as I said, because I'm only discussing massless particles. Uh, I think that uh, if you if you allowed me to work in, uh, we don't know how to deal with massive particles yet. 
uh, if you allowed me to work in, in in with other boundary conditions in anti Jupiter space, I could tell you how you could also deal with stable massive particles. Uh, but as I said in the beginning, in in the Hilbert space, I am talking about we only have uh, those objects which are described by massless particles. Uh, but this is still an interesting question, interesting scenario, because if you thought of a black hole at finite temperature, it does tend to radiate largely into massless particles. And so, so uh, this, if you have a stable massive particle that comes in from past time like infinity and goes to future time like infinity, that's not there in the Hilbert space. Every statement I'm making is about uh, the space of massless particles. Okay, thanks. Okay, uh, the second assumption I, I, I want to make about, about the, the, uh, the, the second assumption I need to make about the full theory is that the operators that map the space of vacua back to itself uh, continue to be contained in this little algebra in the full theory. Uh, this is actually just an assumption that some operators that we know exist uh, in, uh, in the semi-classical theory continue to exist in the full theory. Uh, this assumption can be checked explicitly in the low energy theory. And just like the assumption about, it's manifestly an assumption about low energy physics. It is not an assumption about high energy physics. And so it's reasonably expected uh, to remain true because you just expect that the full UV theory shares some of the low energy properties of the, the semi-classical theory. Okay, so if you, if, you, if, you, if, you believe the, if you believe these two assumptions, then this tells you that the following set of operators, in fact, in the full theory, uh, live in this algebra near minus infinity, and these algebra, these operators are operators which have a, a bra S prime, which have a, a one super translation vac, one soft vacuum here, and then a ket corresponding to another soft vacuum. So they are operators that that project onto a particular super translation vacuum and then cause a transition onto another another soft vacuum. Now uh, any operator manifestly in this in this massless Hilbert space uh, can be written as a sum just in a basis of states. Uh, where these n belongs to the sector that's generated on top of the soft vacuum S, and this m belongs to the sector that's generated on top of the soft vacuum S prime. By the first result I prove, you could generate this operator n by acting with an element of the little algebra on a particular soft vacuum. You could generate this state m by acting with another element of the little algebra on another soft vacuum. By the assumption I made previously, this object that appears in the middle, which is ket s bra s prime, also belongs uh, to this little algebra. And since the algebra is closed under products and linear combinations, uh, this right-hand side is manifestly in A minus infinity. And this is a formal argument that all the information uh, can be obtained near the past boundary of future null infinity. Okay, uh, let me just, let me just, just, uh, I'll say a little bit more about this result, but let me just make a quick recap of what I said and what I proved. I made two main assumptions. I also assumed the positivity of the Hamiltonian, but I assumed also that the vacuum and the full ultraviolet theory will continue to be identifiable by charges at scry, at scry plus minus, which is the past boundary of future null infinity. I assumed that some low energy operators that exist in the semi-classical theory will continue to exist in the full UV theory. And this is already powerful enough to tell us that all information about massless excitations and related to Emil's question, I emphasize that all information about massless excitations is already available near the past boundary of future null infinity, and you don't need to go over all of null infinity. If you made stronger assumptions, as I think this is perhaps what Ahmed was talking about, you could prove stronger results. What I've talked about so far, oops, uh, sorry, sorry. What I talked about so far is just the left part of the blue line, uh, and uh, and in fact I'd, I'd like to I'd like to not talk about the right part uh, because I want to focus on on the on the left part, which is in fact relevant for the information paradox and what I'd like to show. So I'm sure that, that many of you at this point are thinking, you know, this is some uh, abstract uh, operator theoretic algebraic argument, uh, uh, but you know, uh, as I see, uh, for instance, uh, as Nick said yesterday, you know, maybe I'm an astrophysicist, and and how does this really work? So, so I, I want to spend some time uh, trying to describe uh, what the physical consequence of this is and how you could verify what I said previously in perturbation theory. So, the, Sivrat, these, can I just yes. can I just ask a quick clarification? So, yeah. you're saying you're looking at the massless Hilbert space, but is this also the soft Hilbert space? Are these parts these massless excitations? in the limit of zero energy excitations? No, 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 no. The massless Hilbert space can have arbitrary energy. So you can have arbitrary energy in the massless particles, but I, I built them on top of the soft vacuum. 
uh, it's just that the, the particles are massless. I mean, the reason for this is that I, I'm dealing with null infinity and I'm excluding time-like infinity from my analysis. Good. Yeah, it just looked like at the start you were restricting to the strictly soft limit in the Hilbert space, but I, I, I just uh, uh, I can go to... back if you like. Yeah, let me do that. Uh, you see, the, the state I got was, uh, was this state. Uh, so notice these are news operators and, and matter operators. They're smeared with some functions, but this F is some function somewhere in null infinity. So this okay. creates a finite energy graviton. It's really a finite energy graviton. Thank you. Good. Thanks. It's a graviton. It's massive. Uh, so, so Brat, another clarification question. So uh, this little algebra, is it full, complete closed algebra? Uh, is it, it, the, what I proved uh, actually is that it is actually as big as a full algebra, although you might have started, I called it the little algebra because you started with something that looked like it was smaller than the full algebra. But, but, but it's not like gravity, only, it's not, doesn't close only up to small corrections. It actually closes. It actually closes. Okay. Yes. This algebra actually closes. That right? was important for me. This is really an algebra. Okay, so 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 here it's okay. So 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 thank you for those questions. Uh, let me let me now try and say a little bit about about perturbative verification. So as I said, the challenge is as follows. So you're this little astrophysicist. This little this is my stick art figure. This little person who lives here. The person lives near the past boundary of future null infinity. And the challenge you have is as follows. Someone has created a shock wave. That's this blue shock wave. Uh, that's going to come and hit null infinity at a later time. So it's going to come, it's going to propagate with the speed of light and hit null infinity where this blue line hits null infinity. But this person could have created a shock wave of a different kind with a different smearing function. That's this green shock wave. So more precisely, you take some soft vacuum, uh, let's call it omega, which is maybe some superposition of all the soft vacuum I discussed. You excite it with a unitary operator. That's a single particle excitation. So it takes the news operator and it smears it with some smearing function. And then you act with that unitary on the vacuum. Uh, this smearing function FAB has support near U equal to zero. So it really creates uh, the situation that is described in the figure on top. And depending on what you chose for FAB, you would get whatever state, different kinds of states, all of which are labeled by the function F. Uh, so the challenge is, uh, and I'm going to make it a little easier for myself because I want to work in perturbation theory and I just want to give an example. Uh, the challenge is uh, working at small lambda, uh, this little person who lives here near, near the past boundary, the challenge is for this person to figure out the full form of this, this function f. Okay? And that you will agree is a reasonable challenge. You know, some, some, some shock wave is going to come in the future. It's going to cross uh, null infinity in the future. I'm just living here. And I need to use the effects I showed previously uh, to tell me what the what the form of the shock wave is. Okay, so that that's the challenge, and I think it's a reasonable challenge. I made things a little easier for myself by saying that you know I had a single particle excitation as working at lambda. Of course, we could do more general cases. Okay, so uh, in fact, it turns out to be not very hard, and it turns out you can do this in perturbation theory. So the idea is the following: this part, this person in this in lives in the state f. Uh, so because he lives in the state f, this person can compute the just correlation functions, expectation values of observables in this state f. So in particular, you instruct this little astrophysicist who lives near this red place to compute the following two point function. Uh, person computes the Bondi mass as u tends to minus infinity, which is really the Hamiltonian and the, the correlation function of the Hamiltonian with uh, insertion of a news operator which is also inserted in this little short red segment. So this is a two point function, which is manifestly in this little short red segment. Uh, you're computing the ADM mass and the correlation of the ADM mass with another field, which is the news operator. And this is something which an observer can do uh, just while living here. Of course, the observer needs to make accurate measurements of this correlator, but it's something you can do within this algebra. Okay. So can, can I ask? This. Yes. Can I ask? So M is an integrated operator, right? M is yes, the it's integrated over the full sphere. So this means you have to deal with conduct, uh, conduct terms between the mass and the N. Yes. But you said earlier that you're avoiding all conduct. Uh, okay. Oh, uh, yeah, thank you. So this, this case is something, so as I said, once more, this is a Fox space. You can just compute this explicitly. This M is an integrated operator, but it's a particularly simple operator because it's just the Hamiltonian. And it's going to act on the left and just, you know, it's an expectation value. So you don't actually need to worry about what appears in the OPE of these two operators. Uh, so if you expand this out, you need to commute the Hamiltonian through some, through some uh, operator up to first order. And provided that works, I think, I think there, is, there is no problem. 
I mean, maybe what you would be, and what is going to be, I mean, maybe one, one more thing you might've been worried about is that the excitation that creates this F in this measurement, NCD, those are separated by some finite amounts. But as I said, I'm not sure why, why there is a, why there is a, why one is so, so worried because this really is a Fox space in which we're doing computations. So, I mean, there isn't, um, um, but generically, there are contact terms. I don't quite see, unless you show they're not there explicitly. Um, let's see. Um, it's an well, okay. formula. You cannot avoid the contact terms. Uh, okay, but I don't see how the contact terms would be important in this in this formula. You know what I'm going to do is I'm going to make M act in the left and N act in the right, and it doesn't. It's I don't think that the the issue of how M you know you're right that if you try to commute the M through the N, maybe you're worried about the fact that you might you might get uh, and even that's not a problem. But if your answer is infinity, then uh, how can you conclude? Yeah, but I don't. I mean, the, this is a completely finite computation. It's just a two point function within within uh, um, you know of the Hamiltonian with with another operator. So I don't see um, any scope where the contact terms could create any subtlety. I mean, we could discuss it more, but this is a this is a very simple computation. You just take the form of f I had previously expanded out to first order. Uh, you need to compute the uh, the commutator of the Hamiltonian with with another object. Uh, but everything, you know, the final two point function I compute will be will be at separated points. So I don't see. I don't think there's a scope for getting infinity. We could discuss more maybe if you want. I have another question. So you discussed this as a computation that an astrophysicist could do, right? Yes, is that uh, astrophysicist? very powerful astrophysicist. But is he does he need to send signals bigger than faster than light to do this computation or not? Because I'm, no, I'm worried that to measure no, the, the mass, you need the whole sphere. Oh, very good. So uh, thank you, thank you very much. Uh, you're right. That that that's a good point. So in fact, the the way you need to do this computation is you need a you need a set of astrophysicists who surround the sphere, and then uh, they make this measurement, and then at some point they get together and they and they compare the results. Uh, so you're right, and this is actually an important point. It's the reason why, uh, with such uh, with such effects, you don't you, you you don't naively violate causality. So it's not as if you, know, you could measure something instantaneously. You're right. You need to surround the whole sphere, and then. Uh, you make these measurements and later you need to get together and, and, and discuss uh, and combine all the results that you have. I, thank you for that clarification. So how does that solve the problem? It still looks like you're doing something extremely non-local, learning uh, about it's, it. It's not, but all the, all the detectors switched off when the red, when the red slice uh, you know, ended. So the detectors were on for some time and then the detectors switched off. And it's true that you know, because these people are separated, they're living on some large sphere, it takes them time to come together. But let me point out that in a local quantum field theory, you would have had no inclination of what this blue object was because this unitary would just have commuted with everything on this side. So it's true that you need to come together and that, that, takes, that takes some more time and that's in fact an important point. Uh, but uh, you know, uh, you're, you're, everything you're doing is always space-like separated to the blue region. And you're making measurements at a region that's space-like separated. And that is, in fact, also what we want to say when we talk about these, you know, these identifying degrees of freedom on the nice slice. You have some degree of freedom somewhere in a nice slice. You have some other degrees of freedom that are space-like separated. And it's true that, you know, you might have to have many observers who need a lot of time to process their results. But they switch off their detectors and all observations are made in a regime that's space-like separated to the original regime of interest. So, uh, so could I ask a clarification here about yes, the... Yes relation of this to uh, the black hole question that uh, you would like to address, I suppose, later on. Uh, okay. So suppose I have a black hole and it evaporates, like collect some radiation. For simplicity, let me just assume there's one quantum radiator, just one quantum. Mm -hmm. If there are 10, okay, we just talk of 10, but just take one. Mm -hmm. And the question actually is really not one of information. Somehow you're talking a lot about information, but I think that may not be the way the actual problem, there's, I think it's a misnomer. The question really is, I have this one bit out there and I want to know if this is pure or entangled with something which is still inside. Like one was saying, there could be a baby universe which is holding an entangled bit. Suppose I want to know something is pure. What I have to do, I don't have to go near infinity, just let's say at 100 M far from the hole. If it's a pure bit, I, after doing the experiment many times, I can figure out there's some orientation of a stern gun like detector, let's say the X direction, through which every time I pass this bit, it goes up, right? Because spin up plus spin down with uh, equal phases, it will go up. If it's an entangled bit, like in a singlet with something, doesn't matter which way you orient your stern gun like detector, it will always go either up or down. So this is just the experimental question of what you do when you get the bit. It's not a question of who can find out where the information is. 
if it is entangled and the other bit vanishes, you have a problem. Or no, it's, it's not a baby universe. So in this language, can you phrase what you would say? Yeah, yeah. I could mean, I just is the bit entangled or not when it comes out of the yeah. black? Could, could I just emphasize, uh, first of all, uh, the, the point of this argument is, is just to emphasize how you can, in a simple setting, verify this. I mean, the formal result I tried to prove was that all operators in null infinity could be reduced down to these red, red slices. And now I'm trying to give you an example of how, in a situation which would manifestly not work in a local quantum field theory, you have some degrees of freedom that live here, some unitary, which commutes with all operators here in a local quantum field theory, and how you could still determine uh, what the form of the unitary was by just making measurements at a space-like separated uh, point. Uh, so this is an example. We can discuss the, the, the black hole case later. But it's, it's, you're right, it's, uh, and maybe this is related to an, a point that Emil made sometime uh, a couple of days ago. It's not just a question of getting information using entanglement. It's the fact that this unitary would really have commuted with operators here. And so the fact that I can determine what kind of unitary you acted with tells you that there is, you know, this, this, uh, op this uh, set of operators that these little uh, black people, are these little, uh, uh, these little uh, stick people are measuring uh, do not commute with this, with this unitary here. And that's the point I want to make. And in fact, as I said, this is part of a stronger result, which is that, you know, you can write the operator here in terms of a complicated combination of operators here. I should let you go, but maybe later on we can talk yeah, again about this. Yeah, we can come this. back to this discussion. Yeah, sure. okay. But you're right that it's not just a question of getting information using entanglement. It's more that you have a unitary that would have commuted with, with operators here. But now I'm pointing out that it doesn't commute. And so, so the information here is important because you would have got no information in local QST. Okay, so you can compute this. Uh, it's, a, it's just a two-point computation. And you find, you find the following answer for this, this two-point correlation function. Uh, it's, it's a simple computation. And you find that this two-point correlation function gives you the initial function f that was the form of the shock wave integrated with some, some kernel, which in this case turns out to be just 1 by x minus u minus i epsilon. Remember, this x is some operator that lives here because this function f has support in this uh, little region here. Well, this u is something that lives near the red slices. And so these points are always separated. There's no place here where you're getting infinity. However, notice that this right-hand side is analytic when u is extended in the upper half plane. And so if you know this right-hand side very carefully uh, for u being in the region minus infinity to minus 1 over epsilon, you can explicitly reconstruct FAB. Another way of saying this is that by measuring this right-hand side for different values of u, you would get all the moments of f, and that would allow you to explicitly reconstruct what this function f was. So in this example, as I, as I tried to point out, this is a perturbative verification of the statement that in fact, the operators, these blue operators, which you could have evolved using the equations of motion to some operators here, uh, the information in those operators can also be obtained by operators in this little red region. And this is something that you can check explicitly in perturbation theory. So Everett, sorry to ask again about the same thing, but what is yes. the range of x in this integral? What is the what? The range of x, what are you integrating? The range of x is, is somewhere near u. The range of x is limited by the support of f. So as I said, the range of x is somewhere near this region where you can see my mouse, which is near, u, near x equal to 0, whereas u is near u equal to minus infinity. So there is no point where these things are going to become coincident. These, these points are always well separated. x and u are well separated okay. because x is near, near, near 0 and u is near minus infinity. Thank you. Okay, so now uh, something I already mentioned is that, you know, you might have said, well, you know, other theories, including uh, QED have, have charges which are boundary terms and, and could you do the same trick there? Uh, but just a sanity check is that such a trick can never work in a local quantum field theory. It also cannot work in a non-gravitational gauge theory. And the reason is that an, any non-gravitational gauge theory contains exactly local gauge invariant bulk operators, which commute with all elements of this A minus infinity. So if I was living in a theory without gravity, if I was in a world without gravity, I could easily defeat uh, this observer, this set of observers, even if they were spread out all over the celestial sphere, I could defeat all of them by just taking my unitary to be e to the i trace of f squared on zero, where zero is this point here. And this unitary commutes with all the operators that this army of, of observers in the celestial sphere measures. And so the army of, of observers in the celestial sphere can never tell in a non-gravitational theory whether I acted with this unitary, or I did not act with the unitary. So this is a trick that really requires gravity to work. The second question that you might have is, well, you know, the Hamiltonian is a boundary term, but the Hamiltonian just gives you a number. It just gives you the energy. And that's also true in the classical theory. 
But in fact, it's important that this is some, uh, also a trick that would not work in the classical theory. And that's because in the classical theory, there is no sense in which you can take quantum correlations of this Hamiltonian with another operator. In particular, if you just took shock waves that have the same mass, you arrange this F to have the same mass, then all you would measure, all this army of observers would measure outside is the total mass of the shock wave. And if you took shock waves of the same mass, you would not be able to distinguish them classically. You could in fact arrange for the metric to be exactly the same outside some bounded region and be different inside. Uh, so the trick I used here relies on using the quantum correlations of the Hamiltonian with other observables, and that's not something you can do in the classical theory. Okay, uh, uh, the, the concrete effect that I described, the concrete calculation I described uses perturbation theory and states close to the vacuum. But I just want to remind everyone that I gave earlier a proof for more complicated states. And in fact, the proof that I gave gives us an in principle algorithm uh, to read off the form of more complicated states. But of course, the payoff is that if you have more complicated states, you need more complicated operators. Uh, and so that's, uh, you need to make harder and harder measurements. The army of observers that lives in the celestial sphere needs to make more and more careful measurements if the state you started with was more complicated. Uh, but the, uh, uh, the example I gave was a proof of principle that this works, and there is a formal proof that extends to all states, which I described at the beginning. Now, let me also clarify that if you started with an arbitrary straight and scry minus, then to compute the correlators that you were to get in scry plus requires a full UV theory. That's the question of what the full S matrix is about, which I have nothing to say. Uh, what I'm trying to show is that correlators near the past boundary of scry plus contain all information. And this is a result that's easier to show than actually trying to compute these correlators if you give me some initial state in scry minus. Okay. Uh, so uh, let me now uh, turn to uh, the implications of this result uh, for the information paradox. Uh, so, uh, you know, when we phrase the information paradox, it's often phrased in the following sense. You know, we have some star, the star had some details. Uh, it collapsed into a black hole. And at some point, the black hole evaporated. It gave us radiation. The radiation was thermal. It didn't know about the initial details of the star. And then we asked the question of how does information uh, come out of the black hole as it evaporates? However, uh, the result that I've been, uh, I've been trying to emphasize is that, in fact, the information is always outside. If you took some long slice, some, cautious, some nice slice that runs through the black hole, then the information always lives near the boundary of that slice. And in particular, this means that even before evaporation, if you were to make complicated enough measurements, uh, you would have complete information about the state from outside. Of course, in what I proved, I proved something in a limited context in a theory with only massless particles. But as I said, if you allowed me to work in ADS, I could also include massive particles and a similar argument would go through. And so in this case, at least in the system with massless particles, even in four dimensions, one can show that even before evaporation with careful enough measurements, one would know about the state. Okay, let me say one thing before I go on to other proposals that have been discussed a lot in this conference. Uh, uh, there was in the first panel discussion, uh, the question of soft hair and this idea that I'm, that I'm presenting which says that the information is always outside. In fact, it never falls inside. Uh, might sound a little similar to the soft hair theory, uh, the soft hair uh, discussion, uh, but I think there are some differences. Uh, and the difference is that I never required a state to be uniquely identifiable only by the charges near the past boundary of null infinity, uh, which I think is one of the results, results that people uh, who work on the soft hair story would like to prove. Uh, what I required was a weaker condition, which was that correlators of these charges and other dynamical operators outside identify the state. And this is a condition, it's a weaker condition that you can explicitly prove in the Fox space that you get in null infinity. The second thing is that I, I made a number of mentions of super translation charges, but in fact, they were not uh, a key part of the story. Uh, they were a complication uh, for us. And uh, as I said, if you were uh, to work in anti decider space where you put an infrared cutoff with a cosmological constant and there are no super translation charges, uh, in fact, the story would be easier uh, to repeat. And the reason for that is that the Hamiltonian can determine a unique vacuum. And this is something that we discussed in the paper that I gave a reference to. So the super translation charges uh, for us were a complication which we had to deal with in four dimensions, uh, but they're not a key aspect of the story. We are not trying to say that all information lives in super translation charges necessarily. Okay, uh, let me now address the small correction theorem that Samir gave a nice talk about uh, uh, the day before yesterday. And the small correction theorem, if I understand it correctly, uh, runs as follows. 
Uh, and uh, you know, one takes a black hole and one divides it into some regions. There's some region inside, which is A, some region just outside, which is B, and some region far away, which is C. And then we say, you know, we would like the wave function uh, to look like a set of entangled particles, direct product, not times, a set of entangled particles, zero and A times one and B plus one and A times zero and B raised to some power N, so N entangled particles, and then direct product with something else that lives in C. And I think Samir showed nicely that if you start with this wave function, you cannot get an unitary result for the entropy of C. If you later assume that all the bits from B go into C, and you started with this wave function, then you would not get a unitary result for this entropy of C. But what I'd like to say is that what this, this result I described shows is that this is not the correct description of the wave function because very manifestly the Hilbert space does not factorize into a little Hilbert space with A and B and C, rather the Hilbert space of A and B both live inside C. Uh, now this lack of factorization is not a technicality. It's not that you go far away and you forget about it. Uh, it's very, it's an important aspect and it's the fact that operators that live in A or B can also be rewritten as operators that live, that act in C. And that was the result that I tried to show previously by going to null infinity uh, to make everything precise. Nevertheless, even though this is the case, if we were to measure the metric and low point correlators of the metric, we would get the expected answers, even if the wave function is not the naive wave function suggested by a local quantum field theory. So I agree with, 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 the, uh, with Samir's argument that uh, the wave function cannot be this wave function naive picture of having bell pairs. The true description of the wave function has to be very different. It has to be in terms of degrees of freedom that only live near the boundary. But that doesn't preclude the fact that low energy observations that you make near the horizon are the same as what you would expect. I think it's very important that we shouldn't insist on the naive wave function. I think the reason you shouldn't insist in an IV function is that you would run into this problem even in the vacuum if we assume that there was a factorization of the Hilbert space. In fact, that was one of, one of the points of the perturbative calculation. Uh, and you, if you were to extend this perturbative calculation a little bit, one can show that you can in fact generate a precise analog of the strong subadditivity paradox or the monogamy of entanglement paradox that Samir set up, even about the vacuum. And that is because even about the vacuum, as I showed even in perturbation theory, you see a hint of the fact that the operators in C uh, have the same information as the operators in A and have the same information as the operators in B. And you can use this to set up a concrete paradox with the monogamy of entanglement if you assume that even in flat space in the vacuum, uh, the Hilbert space factorizes in this way. But of course, in the vacuum and flat space, we don't expect any novel effects. We don't expect that something special happens you know, because I took some three regions in the space and I call them A, B, or C, uh, nothing special happens. The vacuum is just a vacuum. Uh, but even there, if we were to insist on using the naive bell pair wave function for operators in A and operators in B, and then demanding that it factorizes with the Hilbert space in C, we would run into the same paradoxes. So I think the fact that the wave function is not the naive wave function does not tell one that anything special is happening in any region inside. Uh, the question one needs to ask for that is the question of, what you physically measure when you were to measure the metric or measure some other low energy observation and not a question about what the wave function is, which could be very different, but still give you the same low energy observations as you would even see about the vacuum. So now maybe one more question, which I think has been asked many times in this conference uh, is that somebody could ask, you know, is the information also outside for coal? I've been trying to argue that even in about the vacuum and even in flat space, the information is always outside. You can always get information from near uh, near uh, the past boundary of null infinity. Uh, and is that also the case for coal? Does it mean that, you know, if I wanted to know what was the contents of the hard disk, I could surround the hard disk uh, with some observers and determine what was in my computer. Uh, but of course, the point one needs to realize is that while in principle, this is true, uh, it's an absurd thing to do in practice because to extract the information from black holes, uh, you need to measure S point correlators and S happens to be M Planck divided by the characteristic energy scale of the correlator, which is just the Hawking temperature raised to a power. And moreover, the interesting effect in these correlators comes from the gravitational coupling constant, which is E over M Planck to the same power. So when you try and extract information from black holes, either by measuring the Hawking radiation or by using the kind of algorithms that I described previously, there is no way to ignore E over M Planck effects and to ignore this fact that the degrees of freedom on different parts of a nice slice get identified. 
On the other hand, if you take a piece of coal or you take a piece of 10 qubits, uh, there is a way to keep S finite and we keep, take an E by N Planck to zero. This happens automatically in our world because E by N Planck is always so small. And therefore these quantum gravity effects are unimportant. Of course, they exist even in principle there, but that's not the most efficient way to determine uh, what the state of the coal is. For that, you don't need to use these effects, but you do need to use these effects for a black hole. And that's because of the way the quantities scale in the black hole situation. Okay, so to summarize this part, I would say, I, I believe that this argument shows that the structured horizon is not required to recover information because you can argue that the information is always outside. And so just demanding unitarity or demanding that the information comes out, uh, you don't, uh, you cannot use that to argue that they're structured the horizon. I should emphasize that the argument I gave does not prove that there is no structure behind the horizon because I didn't have a construction of operators behind the horizon and I didn't have some way of computing correlators of operators behind and in front of the horizon. But I think a more limited result is that the information paradox by itself cannot provide a rationale uh, for horizon structure. And that's the, that's the claim I'd like to make about this part. Okay, uh, if there are questions here, maybe I could stop here and then I, I want to say a little bit about the page curve, but I'm sure there are questions here and I could stop and take them. Is that okay, Nick? Yeah, it's fine. Uh, we are coming up on the hour, so- if Oh, you okay, so maybe I can- I can take 10 minutes more and speak about the page curve and then. Yeah, so long as it's no more than about 10 minutes, because I think there's going to be a lot of questions. Okay, great. So, so let, let, me, let me spend uh, 10 minutes and, and talk about a different thing. Okay, so the other proposal that I'd like to make contact with is the proposal that, that was also discussed yesterday, which was about the page curve. So the story I, 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 I have described sounds similar uh, to the story that was described in the talks and also in the panel yesterday. But in fact, there is an important uh, quantitative difference in what I said and what was said yesterday. Uh, what I tried to argue is that if you take a black hole, and for me, the Penrose diagram is always trivial because the black hole always evaporates, uh, then the information is available in an infinitesimal interval near the past boundary of null infinity, but therefore it's also available before the black hole has evaporated. Okay. So in particular, what does this mean for the von Neumann entropy? In particular, for the von Neumann entropy, it means that if you were to compute the von Neumann entropy of this red segment of null infinity, this von Neumann entropy would not change as you extend this segment towards time like infinity. And the reason for that is that the, all the information is already available near its past boundary. And this suggests that the von Neumann entropy of the segment from minus infinity to U0 is just independent of U0 of its ending point for any state in the space of massless particles. Uh, the reason I said that this von Neumann entropy is independent and it's not zero is related to the question that Emil asked. Uh, I've ignored the effect of massive particles and there might be massive particles in the world and I, I don't know how to deal with them yet. And so there's some entanglement between the massless and the massive particles, which I don't see till I reach time like infinity, but I see all the information in the massless particles already near the past boundary. And so I don't get any further information as I go on. And this suggests that the von Neumann entropy is just constant. I think it's not surprising that the uh, curve one gets for the von Neumann entropy on, on flat space is not the naive page curve because the page curve is based on known to be incorrect assumptions about the factorization of the Hilbert space. If one looks at page derivation, it's explicitly based on taking a Hilbert space and factorizing it into two parts. But even on null infinity, because of the constraints that I described at the beginning, even though you have a Fox space, if you were to look at the algebra on different parts of null infinity, which corresponds to the physical observations you can make at different parts of retarded time, this algebra does not factorize. And that is ultimately the reason why I think the page curve is not followed for this slice of null infinity. Now you might say that's very surprising. You know, we've, you've never seen a curve like this, but in fact, you have seen a curve like this. And the place you have seen a curve like this, and I think this is a closer model to evaporation of black holes in flat space, is if you think of small black holes forming and evaporating in ads -CFT. In fact, if you were to consider the fine grain entropy of an observer near the boundary, allow that observer to make all possible observations and construct an algebra out of all possible observations, I think we would always agree that if the, the state was formed from the collapse of a pure state, this fine grain entropy is always zero. This, this entropy doesn't move up and become something and then go down, it's just always zero. Now you might say, well, hold on, uh, maybe that's the case, but you know, Maybe one needs to be more careful. You know, maybe there's a sense in which the information becomes easier to recover after the black hole is evaporated. I don't have anything very precise to say about this, but I think a naive estimate suggests that this is not the case. 
In particular, if you think of this situation where you have a cartoon of a black hole, this brown dust collapsing and then evaporating, uh, you see that at this initial time T1, the information is easy to recover because you just have an observer who can make simple measurements and determine what the state of the system is. After the black hole is formed, which is uh, displayed by this, this slice T2, the information is hard to recover and a naive estimate would suggest that it requires S point correlators. But after the black hole evaporates, which is this time T3, the information is still hard to recover and it still requires at least S point correlators. In fact, if you were to use intuition from thermalization, it would suggest that it's very unlikely that the information actually becomes easier to measure at later times. In fact, most likely the system tends to thermalize even more at later times and therefore to determine its microstate becomes harder at T3 than it does at T2. So there is no sense in which, you know, the information is somehow easier to get at T3 than it is at T2. It's always hard to get after the black hole has formed. Quick, quick so comment. Suggest, very, 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 very quick comment. You can just time evolve backwards. And so, yes. so it's actually easy at, at any time uh, up to sort of polynomial uh, complexity. If you were to time evolve backwards, like you take correlators here and time evolve them backwards, sorry, I didn't understand. If you go to the, the, the ADS space time evaporating black hole, you can yep. start with the state at time T3 yes. and then just, then, then just time evolve backwards with the Hamiltonian up to time T1. So how, uh, is that is that's easier to do than T2? Oh, yes. Oh, no, 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 no. Sorry, sorry, sorry. No, right. Um, so no, I know. Whatever, I, I, whatever I, the difficulty I, is at I, T2, it's, it's the same. It's harder at T3. Hold on a second. Let's hold the questions. There's a lot of people who sent me comments saying they won't jump in with questions. So let's hold the questions and let's see about finish. So okay. can wrap it up in Thank about you. three yes, or four I'll, minutes. I'll be, I'll be done, yes, a few, few minutes more. Okay, so, so the, the claim is that, that the, the, it's harder to get information at T3 than it is at T2. And so this suggests the following picture for the entropy. Either you could define a coarse strain entropy, which is may, may make some correlation functions, maybe low point correlation function. And then you would get the Hawking curve. The entropy just keeps going up. Or you could define a fine grained entropy where you allow the person to measure arbitrarily high point correlators. And then you would find that the entropy is zero at all times in this, in this case. And it's not clear, there might be a regime which yields a naive page curve where you limit what kinds of correlators you're doing, but it's unclear whether such a regime exists. I, I don't know of any such regime. Okay, let me, let me just say, say one thing. I've argued that the von Neumann entropy of black hole radiation is not described by the page curve. And I think gravity is interesting because information is always outside even for a young black hole and not for an old black hole. But I think one can change the question appropriately so that the answer becomes the page curve. Uh, the simplest way to obtain a page curve in ADS, I think is to consider the following setup conceptually. It's a setup that was described by Shiraz and Ofer and, and Toby uh, uh, many years back. Their setup was that of a plasma ball, which looked at a black hole that was localized in the transverse directions. This corresponds to some lump of the deconfined phase that's localized surrounded by some region of the confined phase. In this setup, if you were to compute the entropy of the confined with the deconfined phase by defining those regions on the boundary, you have a factorization of the Hilbert space. And of course you expect that you will get a page curve for the entropy of the deconfined phase or the entropy of the confined phase. I think that the, the recent calculations are morally similar to this. They're not quite using a plasma ball because they're taking an ADS black hole that's coupled to an external bath and then you can compute the entropy of the bath or you can compute the entropy of the original black hole. And because you have factorization, you do expect to see the page curve in this setup. In particular, uh, as, as, as Emma described, you could take a black hole and couple it to a CFT. And then you could argue that the entropy of the red strips obeys this semi page curve. But I think this crucially relies on gravity being non-dynamical in this region. You switched off gravity at some point in the space and then that allowed you to get a factorization of the Hilbert space which then does lead to a page curve. In our world, there is no point at which gravity switches off. Uh, if you were to really take a black hole, which is connected to an asymptotically flat region, then gravity is always dynamical. And then the arguments I gave would, would suggest that you would always expect the trivial page curve for the fine grained entropy. Let me say it may be the case that it's possible to restrict the algebra at future null infinity in some way by throwing out some operators to get the page curve. But the physical statement is, I think, that the information is always outside. And I think it's not correct to suggest that gravity is weak on the red slices, and so we should expect it to obey the non-dynamical curve. In fact, the lessons of these computations and what we have learned is that gravity, even when it's weak, localizes quantum information very unusually. And if we neglect this, we repeatedly run into paradoxes. 
And so we should take the fact that gravity remains dynamical in our world all the way through, uh, even seriously. And this would lead us to believe that the true entropy of Hawking radiation, the fine grain entropy, would be trivial and would not obey the page curve. Okay, so this I'm done. Actually, let me just recap uh, what I said and what the what I feel the implications were. I tried to give an argument that all the information on a uh, future null infinity is present near its past boundary. You can see that by any of these three figures, whichever you 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 you, you like. Uh, this is in some sense the same statement that operators on a nice slice near the boundary uh, can also capture information that lives somewhere in the interior of the nice slice. Uh, and I try to emphasize that this picture follows from semi-classical considerations. I want to emphasize, I did not just postulate this, this picture or come up with it, and I certainly did not add some non-local interactions by hand that connected the interior and the exterior. This is something that just came naturally out of an analysis. I think the implications of this are that an outside observer can always determine the state of a black hole even when it's young with suitably complicated measurements. And the recovery of information by itself cannot be a reason for inferring structure at the horizon. I think this suggests that the fine grained entropy of a black hole in our world would have a trivial page curve. This is not inconsistent with the recent analyses of the page curve that we have seen, but it does suggest that these derivations are inapplicable when gravity is everywhere dynamical, as would be the case for real black holes. Okay, so thank you, and I'm sorry for going over time. Thank you. Thank you so much. Okay, um, so in terms of questions, Samir is suffering from an unstable uh, Zoom link. So I'm going to give him, while he's here, I'm going to give him priority to ask his question first. And then please stick your hands up. I think there's quite a few people who want to jump in. So Samir, go ahead. So let me just continue asking what I was asking before. Mm -hmm. uh, and the reason I'm asking this question is that I'm terribly worried that the way you present the question somehow uh, might just become semantics and not approach the actual black hole question at all. So let me phrase the question in my way and so I can get a sharp answer from you. So suppose I burn a piece of coal and just to simplify everything, it just burns away and emits just one photon. I go one meter away, far away from the coal. I pass it through a stern gunlac and I find spin up. I can do this a hundred times. I'll always find spin up in the stern girl -like. Good. Now I take a black hole with the traditional problem of producing an entangled pair. Because it's entangled, I put the stern girl -like there. If the state is up, down, minus, down, up, half the time it will be up, half the time it will be down. Doesn't matter how I orient the stern girl -like, I can never actually make it always give the same answer. So this is the operational meaning of the emitted quantum being pure or entangled. If many quanta came out, make a sufficiently complicated stern girl lag, and again, you can get to the same situation. In a pure state, you can always get the same answer repeated by the stern girl lag. Don't go near infinity anywhere, just far from the black hole, 100 M, and you will get the same repeated answer for the same black hole made the same way if a pure state is coming out. If on the other hand, the quanta you are holding are entangled with something, does it matter how you set up your stern girl lag? Half the time you will get one answer, half the time you'll get the other answer. So this is the physical meaning of the black hole puzzle because then if the other guy is entangled, you have to do like Juan is saying, either it goes to a baby universe or you have to decide what to do with it and so on. So what I'm asking you now is, what are you saying for the black hole? The black hole emits, let's say just one quantum. If it was pure, the stern girl lag will always give the same answer at 100 M. If it was a mixed state, the entangled thing came out as one zero plus zero one. Uh, it will give different answers. Fifty percent of the time, one answer. Fifty percent of the time, the other answer. So, so it, yeah. what is the answer that you would pick out of these two? Yeah, yeah. So I think I think first of all, this this analogy with with qubits is is very misleading because what you're really thinking about is some pure state, which is an eigenstate of the spins, and then that spin comes out and it's either up or down. In fact, if you w would like to think of a thermalized system, which is an analogy to a black hole, you can think of a gas of photons or really a set of spins which lives in a superposition of all of these different eigenstates. And then it would indeed be the case that if one qubit came out, that qubit would be in a density matrix because it's entangled with the rest of the stuff that remains. And you wouldn't either get only pure up or pure down. So what you're speaking about is a very special microstate, which is of measure zero. And that's the only situation where, you know, in, in coal, you tend to get only up or, or, or down. In general, both in coal and in the case of, of a black hole, or if you if you took a black body radiation and you collected the photons, the bits that you would get out, if you looked at individual photons or individual things that you got, they would always be entangled with something else. 
and the information would always live in e to the minus s correlators of these quanta so this is also true just for black body radiation it's also true for cold i thought the question was it was a different question it's the fact that you can argue that you know th th there's some question about locality that the black hole has an interior and then there's a there, there's there's the paradox which is that you have an observer who can look at this bit that came in uh, from from the black hole and this bit is entangled with the old radiation also entangled with the radiation inside and that looks like it's violating the monogamy of entanglement if that's so not the paradox you, someone just wants to I look at, look at quite understand bit. my question can i clarify my question again yes please yes let's say two bits come out i wasn't worried about two bits coming out let two bits come out from the core it is still a pure state there is some particular state and it is entangled between those two bits and yet it is the same state each time when you make the core the same way and yes you can make a complicated stern gerlach which for the state of those two bits will always give the same answer on the measurement if those two bits were entangled with some other two bits somewhere else doesn't matter how you try to set up the experiment you would get different answers on different observations okay, so the black hole this i would say you would get the same as the and for any entangled or non entangled states uh, in just quantum mechanics and nothing to do yes. with gravity for the so black hole you would get the same as the core. don't take say that the uh, core is too simple because even with one spin it could be spin up plus spin down that's a definite state then if i put the stern gerlach like in the x direction i will all, always get plus x if it was entangled i would get 50% time plus x 50% minus x yes. so, so, so are you so saying that pure versus don't hide under the complexity of no, the no, state no no i'm not hiding under complexity like, i understand your question and the answer is black hole is exactly the same as coal for this purpose you you want to act with the projector psi psi you have the black hole or the state coal which is prepared in a state psi and you really want to act with the projector psi psi which tells you whether in the state psi or not that would give you one for this pure state and zero for some other situation if you had a mixed state and this is a extremely complicated projector it's some combined n body measurement on the coal it gives you one and i claim it would be the same for the black hole but i thought Good. that so was an argument so if you say coal is like the black hole then i need to ask you is there a non local effect which did something to these bits which came out which made it not look which made the entangled bc pair that we started with actually become pure are you adding any other interactions the way one was saying yes there could be non local interactions are you adding some interactions to change the semi classical picture which by itself does not give the answer of the no, core no, i just no, want to know what you change there the semi classical picture is is wrong because it's if you if you take the semi classical picture seriously in that you assume that the hilbert space factorizes that's wrong and that's that's not the semi classical picture that's an incorrect uh that's an incorrect interpretation of the semi classical picture in terms of a naive local theory the semi classical picture already tells you that it's not the case that degrees of freedom on different parts of the slice factorize and the entanglement you're talking about is an entanglement between some simple observables you can do in the hawking radiation and some more complicated observables you can do in the hawking radiation and this is already part of the semi classical picture without adding non local interactions i think that the difference is that you're insisting that it should somehow look like a local quantum field theory with gravity does not so let me just disagree with what you have said and maybe then we can talk later offline to me if i do the semi classical picture in that i know how to do the stern gerlach -like calculation and that picture very clearly will give me a different answer for the coal and uh, if you want to change the semi classical picture some way you will need a new interaction which is what i was asking you about but somehow if i understand right you are saying there is no new interaction i do the semi classical picture like cghs and the answer will be like coal if yeah. that's what you're saying i'm somehow not agreeing but i don't want to take up more of your time right now maybe we can discuss that offline i, I think let's let's i think if you're saying uh, that ahmed has been very patiently waiting so okay. so, uh, so fine. let's, let's okay. Yeah. Ahmed, okay. over to you all right thanks uh, my first comment is actually related to this discussion of samir and uh, subra so i i think i don't think subra is saying that if you measure the radiation coming out of a coal you can deduce what's inside the coal I think what he said what Tsubar is saying is that if you measure things far away at infinity then you can deduce things uh, about 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 the piece of coal that that's that's my understanding of this conversation but uh, let me ask a different question or let me make a different comment or a different question and so on um can you go back to your slide of uh, the evaporating black hole ads yes, subra yes this one yeah so you said that deducing the state of the black hole is easy at time t1 at time t1 yes because it's just everything is just outside so i'm assuming that all the information is near the boundary yeah yeah so i i don't know how you measure complex uh, sort of how complex a thing is but i just wanted to comment that the relation between the state at t t1 t2 and t3 
uh, is simply just time evolution with the Hamiltonian. So okay. if, you, if you end up with, if you, if, you are, if you are at time t3 and you say it's complicated to uh, know what the state is, well, something you can do is time evolve back down to t1 and then do a simple operation. So, so it seems like they, 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 they're not that uh, I, I tend to measure complexity in terms of what is the, the order of the correlation function you would need to measure in order to determine the state. If you were at okay. T1, you might, you might be able to do it using a two point correlator, but once you're, you know, uh, because the physics thermalizes at later times, it's harder and harder. So my, I mean, it's just the physics of thermalization. Thermalization makes it harder to get information than you had earlier. Okay. It's measured uh, in terms of order of correlation functions. Okay, my, my, my last uh, question is, um, uh, is the prediction here that um, that for an observer inside now I'm talking about the flat space case that for an observer that that hovers outside the black hole and collects the Hawking radiation and does whatever uh, and we allow this observer arbitrary power in terms of his analysis are you saying that they that they would uh, they would observe unitary evolution or not or are you saying that this analysis does not shed light on that? Yeah, this analysis does not really shed light on the question of unitarity, yeah, because unitarity is a question of how uh, the state on scry minus, uh, uh, you know, goes to the state on scry plus. Uh, my information was more, my, my discussion was more of an information theoretic question, which was, you know, does the observer get more information as you go over on scry plus, or can you get all the information at the beginning? Uh, so the question of unitarity is a question of the S matrix, how you map scry minus to scry plus, about which I did not say, I did not say anything. I assumed, in fact, I mean, I would assume that the theory is unitary, but I, this discussion doesn't show that the theory is unitary. Okay, thank you. Okay, uh, David, you've been waiting. Yes, uh, just curious whether your conclusions allow for the possibility of the formation of a baby universe that would be completely disconnected from future null infinity? Uh, no, so I, I would assume that the state, uh, maybe this is related to the previous question. The state, so I, you know, uh, the Hilbert space I started with was the space you could get by starting with different vacuum on future null infinity and acting with operators on future null infinity. Uh, I assume that that's the same as the state that you would get by starting with different vacuum on past null infinity and acting with operators. But, you know, may, maybe it's not. But the discussion I had was restricted entirely to states you would get by, uh, you know, the states you would use in the S matrix, whatever you get by starting with vacuum on null infinity and acting with some operator on null infinity. Okay, so, so you would exclude are, disconnected sectors. I would, you know, something that's just totally different. I would not see it. I see. Okay, but then uh, you do want to allow uh, for a, pic a semi-classical picture in some approximation, which would involve a black hole interior. Maybe you can switch to one of those slides that had uh, yeah, sure. the interior. Oh, maybe this one? Yeah, but the black hole for me will always evaporate. So I, you know, if you if it evaporates back into massless particles, uh, I don't know which one. Uh, maybe let's go to the first one. Um, yeah. I mean, you, you you think there's a black hole here? Of course, there's a black hole, but at some point the black hole evaporates. So for me, the the Penrose diagram is always the trivial Penrose diagram. The black hole evaporates and it's gone into massless particles. As I said, you could do the Good. same so thing that, in ADS. Yes. That that part of the story seems very similar to what a Fosball model would claim. That there may be some approximate description of a black hole horizon with an interior for some purposes for some intermediate times, but actually at the end of the day, the causal structure of space-time is trivial. So there it seems you're in very much in agreement with what seems to be coming from I think from so, but I think, I think everyone, I, I, don't, I don't want to speak for everyone, but I think I would suspect that many people are in agreement that if you really look to the causal structure of space-time, uh, black hole evaporates, the causal structure is trivial. I mean, I think the question of, well, I think the question I was trying to ask was, is there an argument one can make that if the observer falls into the, the horizon, measures a metric, the observer sees like some deviation from the Schwarzschild black hole? And I think this, I didn't even show that you don't see a deviation, but I just wanted to claim there's no argument that one will see a deviation. Okay, I just I just wanted to yeah I think that clarifies it. So it, it seems that your picture is actually strikingly similar to what one would get in a Fosball model for for this particular aspect that sure. that really uh, the causal structure is trivial and information is returned, and I think somehow the problem seems to be then still to explain why the semi-classical evolution of of the state on slices breaks down. It seems to me that question is still not answered fully. 
but but I think that uh, yeah okay I think that the claim that the semi classical evolution leads to information loss I think is does not account for the fact that gravity has this you know stores quantum information in this unusual way you can you know there, there's no in some sense there's, there's no question of information loss because you take some nice slices and the boundary of these slices always has information about the about the interior so. Uh, okay, we, we could probably okay. continue for a long time, but I want I to cede the floor to other people. Yes. So uh, thanks. Juan is next on the list of questions. Over, over to you, Juan. Yeah. So I just want to understand something a little better. So when we, we could also make the statement in ADS that uh, observables near the boundary contain the whole information about the interior. Is that? Yes. Okay. Now, the way I understand this statement is the following that um, if um, so you have the local operators in the field theory, which correspond to uh, observables which are very close to the boundary on the, uh, in the gravity description. Yes. But when you start taking operator product expansions and contract, con constructing more complex operators out yes. of the simple, simple basis of operators, then in the boundary CFT description, of course, they are always living in the, in the Hilbert space of that boundary CFT. But when you translate them to the bulk, they might be operators which are extended through the bulk. They, they, they really uh, are more, let's say, complicated. Maybe you can construct them using HKLL or whatever that morally are uh, operators which are living really inside the bulk. So I think that uh, it's only in the CFT description that you can think of these operators as really localized in the boundary. When we use the gravity description, I think the operators uh, will have gauge representatives which are really living in the bulk. And that's how we recover the more intuitive uh, results in perturbation theory. Uh, uh, yeah, I, I, I mean, I, I don't disagree with that in that there is, well, uh, yeah. So do you want to say so more? When the astrophysicist uh, tries to measure something complicated that tries to measure the spin in the center of the bulk, that operator in the gravity description would correspond to actually measure a spin in the center of the bulk. It's not that there will be another thing. It's just measuring the spin in the center of the ball. Um, it's um, just that I, the, the complicated thing they can do is evolve backwards in time and then sending a signal and sending a machine that will go and measure the thing in the middle of the bulk and yeah, so on. Yeah. Um, yeah. Okay. I, I mean, I don't disagree with the physical picture, but let, let me just make a few comments. Uh, first, I, I, I agree. I mean, this is in some sense similar to the notion of holography in that, you know, in, in ADS, we have a boundary of, of, of ADS and we say information is available uh, near the boundary. And here we have a Cauchy slice. You can think of null infinity as being a limit of Cauchy slices. And this is a statement that information is available near the boundary of that. The second statement I wanted to make related to what you said is that even in gauge theories, it's often possible to have a precise notion of what it means for an operator outside a region, even though it's not always possible to make precise a notion of an operator inside a region. That's because you take Wilson lines and you take Wilson lines that go from infinity and that end at some point. And so there is a notion, I think, a precise notion one can have of operators that are outside a, a region and one can make it mathematically precise. You're right that, that in a sense, you know, these operators that you're, you're describing by constructing the algebra outside a region, uh, in some sense, also probe the bulk. And that, that's, that's, that's in a sense what's happening here, happening here physically. But I think there is a sense in which you can define the, the algebra of operators outside a region, even in ADS. Uh, I think in flat space, I think the, the situation is even simpler because we we really have a have a free space. We really have a free theory that lives at null infinity. It's really a Fox space. And I think there is a, a concrete sense, as concrete as in any other quantum field theory, that you can define a notion of algebras that live on cuts of null infinity. And I think, uh, you know, in this case, the it, and if you had a local quantum field theory, it would really be the case that algebras in different cuts of null infinity contain different information about the state. And this, the surprising thing here is, I think that in the theory of gravity, uh, it's not the case. So I agree that physically, in some sense, you could think of this as, as probing the, the interior. Uh, but uh, you know, there is a mathematically precise sense in which you can define algebras associated to, to cuts. And I think it's much even simpler in flat space than it well, would be. My suspicion is that when you do it mathematically precise, you, you will find that the actual operator is defined in the interior when, when you do it in the gravity description. Uh, but, but this, I don't this think that there are two there, I don't think there are two different gravity descriptions, one with the operator purely outside and one where it's uh, no, I think the operator inside is the operator outside. But what I wanted to say was, let's start with someone who can act with operators near a cut of null infinity. And you're right that that operator, that when that person acts with that, that cut at null infinity, effectively that also modifies the inside, if that's that's the claim. I agree with that. So, uh, I mean, that was, that was part of the conclusion. Uh, 
is is that different from what you're saying? I mean, I agree that there are no two different descriptions. There is another descript. I mean, there is another gauge description which that operator lives inside. Uh, but what I wanted to say was, if you start with this mathematically precise description at null infinity, then that captures all operators in the theory. There are no additional operators that remain in the theory. Would you? Uh, I, I mean, I and that's a, that I is a surprising. I want to understand problem. better what you're saying. You? There's, there's another question lined up. So, okay, uh, let me pass the question to Vasco. So hi. So I have uh, uh, like two two questions. One that I know very little about, and one that I hope I know more about. But so the first one is. Um, Can you put your uh, video in, feed on? Uh, in the in the discussion yesterday and and the previous days, there were mentioned some non-perturbative effects related to these island conjectures. So so what in your model um, is is there like. I mean, when you take, properly take into account the non-locality that is present in even in empty space, you, you claim that there is no paradox. But do you actually require non-perturbative non effects, or where do they hide in in your story? Yeah, I I think the non-perturbative effects would be important uh, physically. Because, I mean, because you know, in the end, you need, uh, as I said, the the question of dynamics was something I, I I didn't address, and there you know there must be there must be some sense in which you get if you really wanted to compute what the correlators on Sky Plus were. You would need some way to compute all of these non-perturbative effects, uh, but um, uh, I mean the statement here is 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 somewhat simpler. It's that you know you you have this fog space. You give me a you give me a state in this fog space, and you can get information from this little region here. Uh, that information does require you to compute correlators up to an accuracy e to the minus s, and you know uh, you could that 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 is a that's a non-perturbative correlator which you would need to. You know, if you said you can only compute things within perturbation theory. You would not be able to get all information. I don't know if that answers your question. Uh, I don't know if that answers it. Or if I should well, say. I, I, I guess yes. I mean, aside from like the fact that one has to figure out the mechanism to, to be able to perform these these non-perturbative measurements, but that's a, of course a very complicated. Uh, yeah, yeah. There, there's a question, and maybe that's related to what Juan was asking, which is, you know, how do you measure very? So the example I gave was an example in perturbation theory where you measure a two-point function. In principle, yeah. you would like to measure more and more complicated uh, correlation functions that live near the boundary of null infinity, and then you could start asking more physical questions about, you know, what is it that the observer really has to do physically to measure these things? Uh, but I think the, I mean, okay, we've not really gone into that question. The naive assumption here was uh, that, you know, you've gone far away, uh, you've gone off to null infinity where the theory is trivialized, and so there is some precise sense in which you can speak of measurements that this observer makes at null infinity. Just in the sense of asymptotic quantization, but I mean you're right. There's some more physical question about how does this observer really physically make those measurements, uh, which mm -hmm. I haven't discussed. All right. Okay. Uh, I think. Oh, go ahead. But make it quick. Uh, uh, okay. Yes. Yeah, so I'll go very quick. So um, it's related to what what David said about the, the like the similarity between your picture and the first ball picture. So if I have one first ball microstate, and uh, according to your argument, excitations around the state same as in empty ADS, they would be accessible from everywhere. But yes. say that now, for some reason, this state transitions to another microstate, another coherent microstate. What happens to that, to this, to these uh, fluctuations near about near 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 the near the boundary, which are like in a very low curved place? Um, that, I mean, when it transitions, what, how do how do this information, which is about the, say that we believe that it's in the cap, but it's also accessible from the boundary, and if the first ball transitions, how would I be able to, like? I'm, I'm not sure I understood the question about transition, but I think that the picture you're describing is similar to this. I mean, you could do. I, I didn't say it here, but um, uh, you know, you could have. You could have. I gave a perturbative calculation which works uh, about about empty space. Uh, you could have actually done this perturbative calculation about a different state, including a black hole state. So you could right. have started with a black hole uh, a state, which is close to energy eigenstate, and put in this kind of an excitation on top of it. Or you could start with some fuzzball solution and put an excitation. And then uh, the question is, uh, can you determine what the form of the excitation was? So the only question I was asking in perturbation theory was, can you determine what the shape of this function f is? And as I said, you could do this about a, a black hole state where the excitation was behind the horizon. And I think the calculation here shows you you can determine the shape of the function f. Now there's another question, which is if you didn't have the vacuum here, but a more complicated microstate, could you also determine the form of that microstate? And I think the answer for that is also yes, but it would not work with this kind of a two-point correlation function, 
you would mm -hmm. need a much higher point correlation function to determine right. what the microstate is. Right, I guess you get that, that, that was the question. Yeah, thanks. Okay, we should wrap it up here. Um, let's take a five minute break and resume at 16.05 with Eric's talk. I hope that's okay with Eric, but uh, I for one need just to walk around for a minute. So five minute break, we'll start at 16.05. I'll leave the YouTube um, live streaming open so that we don't get another live streaming. So uh, if, if people have questions and so on, everything you say will get recorded. Okay, so we can continue discussing or something or you're, you're muting it? You can continue discussing. If, it's, if you're okay with it being live stream, you can continue discussing, sure. Okay. The discussion will be unmoderated, but go for it all by right. all means. And all recorded. Right. Okay. okay, sure, great. I, I don't know if Juan, Juan is still there. I, I, I don't know if I... Uh... One, one seems to have left. Okay, it's too bad. Hi, you sharing. Hi, Eric. You can start. Yeah, should I stop sharing my screen so Eric can put his slides up? Yeah, I don't know how this works. Um... Eric, you can just start sharing over you, and he will just automatically kick you out. So. There's a green button at the bottom of the of the screen. Uh, all right, so I should do that now already. Yeah, it's good to do it now so that we know that everything works and we don't have any problem. Uh, let me think. Uh, can I do a separate PowerPoint presentation? I don't know how that works. Anyway. You see my presentation? Yeah, it looks good, Eric. It looks good. I, I want to just put something up on the screen before your talk, but... Uh, uh, That's fine, yeah. but then you uh, we can I'll, switch again. Exactly. So that you, we can see everything, we can hear you. It's all good. Eric, can you try moving your mouse to make sure that the mouse, we can also see the mouse? Ah, we can see the mouse, okay. And Excellent. so I can, I think I want to turn it into a laser pointer, is that fine? Yeah, yeah sure. per perfect, even better. It's even, if you can make it bigger, that would be better yeah, still. How do I do that? Uh, maybe the same yeah. preferences, I'm not sure. This is PowerPoint, so. Yeah. Okay, it's probably fine. I mean, it's certainly visible, Eric, don't worry. Oh, that doesn't work. Let's see. Sorry, I'm just going to take the screen for one minute. Yes, go ahead.
almost there. Yeah, we're there. Okay, so we come to the place of honor, the last speaker of the conference. But I, before we start, I just want to say, originally we planned this conference to have everybody here in Paris and have a workshop afterwards. If all goes well in the universe, uh, we will try and do that exactly that, but next year on pretty much the same dates as this conference and then a workshop afterwards. But hopefully uh, we will be able to do that. Eric, if you would like to take over, that would be great. And our last speaker is of course, Eric, and I lost his title one second. Um, who will speak on JT, DTZ, and the island phenomenon. So Yes, all right. Thank, thank you, you very much. Thank you. Uh, it's very fun to be here, actually, at this conference. I mean, it's uh, wonderful, all the discussion we've had about a very interesting topic. And, uh, of course, there are still uh, uh, questions to debate. I mean, the problem has not been solved. I'm not going to do this in this talk, but I hope I'll give you some perspective on this uh, uh, well topic that has been discussed yesterday uh, related to these islands. And um, I have to close something here because I think I'm seeing. You're not, uh, you're not sharing at the moment, so. Oh, that is the point. Yeah. Right. I, I stole it from you. Yeah, that happened. Um, did something happen now? You're seeing my, yep. my screen now? We've yep. got it. All right. All right, so the title is in the JT, BTC, and the island phenomena. I, I want to present a, a model, a, a low dimensional model, where this uh, island phenomena can be sort of demonstrated in a kind of visual way. Uh, I mean, there's lots of related work that I will mention as I go along. The work I'm going to be talking about is based uh, on research I'm doing together with uh, uh, Tivita Verheide. She's a graduate student in. Uh, a PC student in, in Amsterdam, uh, here, here she is. I mean, she's in the audience somewhere. Um, anyway, it, it's work in progress. I mean, uh, we have uh, many solved many questions, but we have some uh, remaining questions at the end that I will uh, get to. Uh, but what is the motivation? Of course, uh, the motivation is the black hole information paradox. I hope that uh, my slides continue. Oh, there it goes. Yeah, uh, I mean, how does the information come out? I don't think we know this yet. Maybe we have made progress with understanding more about uh, concepts about entanglement entropy, how that behaves. But it would be very nice if we can have some better idea of what the microscopic description is of the evaporation process in such a way that it's manifestly unitary, but also that it has a very clear connection with the space-time geometry. Anyway, uh, this cannot be solved yet for any realistic models, but maybe toy models can help us along the way. And what I'm trying to talk about, I mean, what I'm doing here today is also uh, trying to get to such a, such a model. Of course, as I said, it's related to other people's work. But first, let me start because the, the topic of the conference is black hole microstructure. And then uh, there's part of the discussions are going about uh, the first ball type geometries. And that gives a very different picture than the other perspective, which is more like EPR as ER, where we do generally talk about a horizon and maybe even what's behind it. Well, for black hole microstates, I mean, for the, the first pole geometries, we, we don't have horizons. But I think there are still uh, two sides of the same story. And the way I think about the connection is that, that uh, if you take a typical black hole state, I mean, it also interacts with particles that go in and things that go out. And eventually it builds up entanglement uh, in such a way that you can never be sure in which of these many uh, first ball geometries the black hole is sitting. I mean, the, the, the first ball the geometries themselves are quantum states that become entangled with the outside. And then you get a picture, picture like this, that all of these geometries, uh, they have, uh, well, some partner outside that then indeed, if you then connect them, uh, starts looking something like the right hand side. And this, of course, is the, the same idea as EPR is ER, in the sense that there is a, 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 a entanglement with the outside. And so the first ball is no longer in a pure state, but it's actually in a mixed state, but it's sort of entangled with another set. It need not be another set of first balls. Uh, I mean, that's one way we construct uh, the, the Einstein Rosen bridge. 
but even if it's just entangled with some outside radiation, you still have this picture that there is something that may mimic the inside of the horizon. And it may be in, in the way that, that Nick said yesterday that there's maybe some mirror effect happening, but it's the entanglement uh, between this first ball and its environment that, uh, and the radiation in particular that uh, uh, allows you to also think about questions uh, related to the, the inside of the horizon or the location of the horizon. And then the two pictures sort of become the same. Anyway, this is my perspective on this. I want to talk about indeed this ideas of um, islands and uh, the island formula, the extension of the Ryutokinagi formula that helps us compute a, a fine grained form of uh, entanglement entropy. I've written down the, the formula down here. I mean, it has been uh, discussed in, in the talks yesterday. Uh, it became first was discussed in the papers by Pennington and by Almiri and his uh, collaborators. Uh, the point of view that I will be taking is very much connected to uh, this follow up paper by uh, Ahmed, uh, Juan, and, and their collaborators. And they considered a slightly different situation than Pennington. Pen Pennington actually considered evaporating black holes. And in that case, uh, you, you actually understand that, that uh, the extra uh, quantum extremal surface that determines the, the, the start of where the island appears must be behind the horizon. While here in this case, when you consider eternal uh, or, or yeah, actually black holes which are in equilibrium with the radiation uh, or some eternal situation, then there are islands that are uh, outside of the horizon. Anyway, the two, two stories are, are very similar. And we're actually going to look at the toy model that's more related to this uh, ex uh, example. Uh, but still, uh, as I said, the same phenomena uh, will occur. So what is this island phenomena is, of course, this idea that uh, if you think about uh, the, the, the information that has dropped into the black hole, I mean, uh, Hayden and Prescott already taught us that there's a certain time, if you wait, that uh, the information has to come out. So there is a way that uh, things that have dropped into the black hole can be reconstructed from the radiation. And in this story, this is explained in terms of, well, an entanglement wedge that's sort of broken up into two parts. And uh, this indeed is one thing we like to explain better how this is possible. And also the surprising fact that this uh, story, which kind of uh, could be expected uh, on sort of general quantum mechanical grounds, but that it's also so nicely geometrically represented. I mean, that's a, sort of a surprising fact that the region in which the information can be recovered is actually a particular region behind the horizon. That to me at least came as a surprise when this, uh, these papers came out and was not something that I thought was manifest uh, in the papers uh, that were written earlier on this problem. Anyway, this is also the aspect that we want to uh, clarify with, with a particular model. So we want to have a, a simple model that geometrizes the gravitational, but also the semi-classical entanglement entropy of the, of the radiation. I mean, both of them uh, we, we want to have geometrical. Uh, it wants to illustrate and, and sort of exhibit this ion phenomena. It also uh, want to make a connection with what is known as quantum error correction. I will explain the use of this term in this context later on. Uh, there have been previous papers that have um, emphasized this a lot, and there's a lot of related work. Uh, here I have a, an incomplete list, I think. Um, there is certainly a, a, a nice, very simple model by, by uh, Arkers and, and Engelhardt and, and Harlow that uses uh, pictures like this. I mean, this is uh, one way of thinking about this island phenomena in terms of the entanglement with the radiation or the entanglement with the black hole. I mean, but our model is going to be a little more sophisticated than this one. There are actually uh, other papers that have similar ideas. Actually, there's one very recent one that came out this week by Rob Myers and his collaborators. Uh, and actually, the model I'm going to describe sort of has some uh, similarities with what they're, they're doing. Anyway, these are our related works. And certainly, some of these papers also were inspiring uh, for our work. In particular, there is this paper by uh, Almeri and Maldasena and, and their, uh, well, Mah Mahaya and uh, Xiao, uh, that uh, they have a very simple model, uh, a two-dimensional model coupled uh, to a bath. 
And uh, it can be viewed in various ways. One is that you have a CFT with a boundary that's coupled to a quantum mechanical model. But then this quantum mechanical model is dualized in terms of some two-dimensional geometry that describes, in this case, uh, for the extremal black hole an ADS, pure ADS. But there are other thermal uh, examples where you have also, uh, uh, well, non-extremal situations. And, and all these cases are quite interesting. I mean, and they indeed uh, showed that you can understand or even describe quite explicitly um, this island phenomena. One of the uh, points which I find somewhat confusing about this uh, proposal is that there is a CFT that lives here. Uh, and what they've argued is that the dual theory in here, uh, in the bulk, is also not just gravity, but the gravity coupled to that same CFT. And uh, one of the questions I would have for them actually would it be, uh, well, why does there, is there a CFT even living in this part of the, the dual geometry, but doesn't that require this quantum mechanical system to be some uh, special of some special kind? So uh, anyway, it's a, it's a model uh, and that maybe there are other models that, that uh, discuss this slightly differently. Indeed, what we will uh, do different is um, the way that the boundary conditions are being uh, discussed uh, between these two systems. But for, for some uh, elements, actually, it's quite similar uh, as this discussion. And actually, we will compare our results to uh, what's happening, uh, in what they is found in the, this uh, paper. So uh, to motivate the model, let me uh, make this toy, uh, actually cartoon for the page curve. Everyone knows it, but the reason for me to show it is that there is a very uh, intuitive way of thinking about the page curve. Namely, if you have a Hello, Eric, we cannot uh, Eric, hear Eric, we've lost Your sound. Muted. Your microphone is muted. Now we can Sorry. hear you. We couldn't yeah, hear yeah. you. My, my mouse was uh, going in, in the wrong uh, parts of the, the screen anyway. Okay. Back up 20 uh, seconds. Yeah, so what I wanted to say is that the page curve can be understood by starting with a pure state, uh, which is highly entangled, and simply separating the same state in different ways. And so there's no real time evolution. The only thing you're doing is you're, you're splitting the state in different ways, uh, where if you take a small part on one side and a big part on the other side, there is, of course, some entanglement, but that entanglement grows if you make the two sides almost equal. And eventually when the other part becomes smaller, it has to go down again. Uh, so it's the same set of degrees of freedom, but the only thing that changes is the way you split them up. Uh, and you get, of course, a mixed state if you do so, but if you have only a very small part or actually the entire system is say in B, then of course it's a pure state again. So you understand the page curve simply by thinking about one single state that you just divide up in different ways. So that's a simple qubit type model of black hole if, uh, evaporation. So we're gonna be motivated by that and making ideally uh, a similar sort of simple model. The other thing, uh, where am I? My slides are not continuing. Oh, there we are. The other thing I mentioned is quantum error correction. So that's a similar idea. Uh, and here I illustrated it with a AD, pure ADS space. And this is uh, from the paper by Almeri, Sidong and Harlow, as they sort of emphasize the fact that the information in the bulk is sort of spread around uh, the boundary in a way that allows you to reconstruct only part of the space time if you have uh, partial knowledge. Say, if you only know part C, you can do this orange part. B, the, the green part, and A, the blue part. But then if you combine, for instance, A and B, then you have much more power. You can actually describe this white part in the middle. So there's a, clearly a way that some information is being spread over the boundary in ways that not individual uh, observers that only have part of the boundary can see it. And this is sort of the analog with quantum error correction. Now the black hole problem has a very similar uh, aspect and this was emphasized by Pennington and actually by uh, 
um, Hayden and Pennington actually before that, uh, but it is actually leading up to this idea of islands in, in a quite a beautiful way. Because uh, there's a similar uh, way I can divide up uh, a black hole, say this is a black hole in ADS space. I now separate the boundary into two parts, but now I add uh, something that's uh, entangled with the states in here. So this state could be a first ball again, but now the first ball is entangled with some outside radiation, which makes it a mixed state. And now we have a very similar question, namely, what, uh, how can we describe what's happening in this white part? Uh, if you have the green and the orange part, you can do this, but with the green part, you cannot. So if you only know this part, then this is, uh, you cannot describe it. So the other way around, if I have only the, the blue part and, and this uh, environment, I can of course describe what's inside here. So without this, if I would be a pure state, let me indeed sort of imagine that first, you would actually be able to move these points away th this way and actually move this Riedagenergi surface through the solution because it's a pure state, there's no entanglement there and you would be having sort of this bipartite uh, division similar to what I showed for the page curve, because then there's some way if you have more than half of it, you can actually describe the black hole and its neighborhood. But the entanglement with the environment actually makes it more difficult. And this is sort of uh, leading up to this uh, kind of island phenomena, as I will uh, explain. Anyway, the, the thing I want to emphasize here is this analogy with uh, quantum error correction. But this picture is the one that we actually want to use now also for a black hole model. Could I, could I just well, I emphasize that I want to have some geometric model that uh, has... Uh, Eric, yes? uh, Samir wants to jump in with a question, I think. Yes, go ahead. Uh, just a question on, your, on the slide you had up there previously. So if that black hole was... Uh, if that first ball was replaced by just an ordinary piece of coal and that was entangled with its maybe radiation outside, you would have exactly the same, right? Uh, is there some difference between the black hole and a piece of coal here, or this is generic? Anyway, I didn't think about the piece of coal here, but the amount of, um, I mean, the, the story about this quantum entangle uh, error correction you can do in a quantum computer, it's not something that needs for black hole. So the story about uh, secret sharing and how you can encode information is purely about the information part. Uh, so here I've explained it with entanglement. I've not actually used the fact that this is a black hole or anything of that sort. But uh, I think if you want to do what I've said, I mean, uh, I don't know what you're actually asking about this picture. I think the story I explained is pretty obvious. It can be explained with three qubits. And here I would do something similar. No, that's fine. I just it was going to later ask if you would find island also for a coal and so on. But I would just turn. Anyway, to that's not the right moment to ask that question. Okay. Um, so here I had uh, already uh, indeed some related papers uh, mentioned. I mean, this is again the same slide. I want to add something here that the idea which I get from this previous uh, uh, description is that I want to have indeed. Uh, a description of this black hole and radiation that sort of consists of two parts of the same quantum system, very similar as, as the story about the page curve. And I also want to do something that uh, allows a dynamical description. Actually, this is the part that is still in progress, but I will explain a little bit about that uh, as I go along. So this is the model. Uh, it's slightly different from uh, the model that, that uh, in the AMMZ paper, they have uh, had a single CFT uh, with uh, a quantum mechanical boundary. The thing that we are doing different is that we uh, actually think about the CFT also as having a thermal state. Uh, that means there's a temperature in here that allows you to exchange an even uh, energy between the CFT and the, and the quantum mechanical system. Uh, so you can think about the CFT as living on a strip and the quantum mechanical systems on the boundary here, so of the two sides of the strip, and they uh, radiate in and maybe there's things being exchanged the other way. The idea of course is eventually to have quantum contact coming from the quantum mechanical system and view that as Hawking particles. So we wanna think about this quantum mechanical system 
uh, again, as a, uh, a model that can be dualized to a, an ADS2 type uh, gravity, uh, but we'll do it in a slightly different way. Um, first of all, the picture of the space-time diagram is more like this. Uh, instead of having the black hole uh, in the middle, or sort of the gravity in the middle, and then the CFTs on the side, we have actually the CFT here, and these are two uh, black holes sort of on the opposite sides of the boundary. So when I dualize the quantum mechanics, I get some black hole type geometry, which is two dimensional. And then if you would uh, formulate a story similar to an island question with, by saying, well, what is entangled? What's the entanglement wedge of a part of the, the, the thermal CFT? You would have this green uh, region that, that you're asking about. Then you do expect also here to have uh, islands uh, Sort of outside these horizons very similar as in their result but as i said the picture sort of inside out in the sense that we put the cft in the middle and we have the two uh, quantum mechanical systems with the gravity duals uh, on the outside so you might also say this is double doing this twice but as you, as you will see we do something different with the gravity side and also the way that we think about the bulk theory will be slightly different uh, because um, we're not going to view this as uh, just a two-dimensional model. We want to actually add even more, uh, one more dimension by, uh, again, dualizing this CFT. So the basic idea is to dualize a the thermal CFT to part of a, part of a BC, BC geometry. And the reason why it's part, of course, is that the CFT is living on a strip. Uh, we also want to dualize this quantum mechanical model to a quantum uh, of JT gravity. But now we're going to think about JT gravity as being obtained from a three-dimensional gravity theory by um, reduction. So the JT is the reduction of a, also a part of a BGC geometry. Actually, you can show that uh, the, the fields and, and the solution and, and the field equations even of JT gravity are identical to that of a 3D gravity if you assume a certain uh, well dimensional reduction. If you then uh, combine these two steps, then you can think about the total set of degrees of freedom of the quantum mechanics and the CFT as sort of making up one entity, namely a full BTC geometry. So it's a, a sort of a one object that is divided up in different ways, either being viewed as a JT gravity part or as uh, the CFT part. In pictures, it looks like uh, this. So anyway, the state that we're looking at, you can think about as a pure, actually, uh, JT gravity, uh, sorry, uh, ADS3 state, so BTZ. And then we're going to divide it up into two uh, parts. And we're going to do it in this way. So there's uh, a picture before page time and another picture after page time. So uh, the CFT is going to be a dual, as I said, to part of the geometry. So uh, the CFT you can think about as living here on the boundary. It's a thermal state a dual to a part of this black hole. So the entropy you can then read off also from the horizon area. And even the energy you can then associate to a, a fraction of the energy of this black hole. The other part uh, describes the JT part, but we're not going to dualize it. What we're thinking about is actually doing a reduction along the angular direction in such a way that we're basically thinking about these as end of the world brains uh, for the for the, the, the ADS 3D geometry. <coughs> but then there's uh, some gravity induced on this. Uh, these brains and that gravity is actually the JT gravity and you can see this also as I said as a dimensional reduction along this angular direction. Now before I play uh, after page yes Euclidean picture sorry is this intended to be a Euclidean picture no sorry this is a, a slice a slice okay thank you this is a time slice just I, I fix a certain time so time is going to actually evolve uh, at least that's uh, what we're hoping to get to is some dynamical model. But now um, you can think about it also as a static situation, describing a black hole which is young kind of situation. This is where the radiation is not uh, it's only, only less than half of the system. Here the radiation is more than half of the system. And what is the black hole part is a smaller part. So here in this picture indeed before and after page time can clearly be distinguished. 
by just saying which part of the, the boundary is the largest. <clears throat> okay, thank you. So uh, also this dualization helps us then to geometrize the entanglement entropy that we can compute between the black hole and the radiation. Um, and of course, uh, with the, give, the pictures I've already shown, you can kind of already expect there should be some transition happening uh, at the page time. So what I want to explain now in the following slides is how uh, one can think about um, this part as a thermal state. I'm gonna do a calculation for this part, but actually uh, this part and that part uh, are very similar or even the, both sides are similar. They, they just are a part of the uh, BTC geometry. Now, normally BTC has a, an angular coordinate that uh, goes around the boundary, which is uh, two pi. But we also know that we have BTC geometries which have uh, conical deficits. And this is sort of how the way I'm thinking about this, this part is that if I would identify this side with that side, I would create a conical deficit in here. But that's just another BTC geometry. And that's what I want to show on the next slide. Namely, if I take a, a BTC uh, with a conical deficit, and here I've chosen a particular BTC, namely one which has a radius equal to the ADS radius. But the thing that's uh, varying is uh, its uh, angle, uh, angular coordinate. So if beta is some parameter, uh, then phi is no longer periodic uh, modulo two pi, but periodic modulo this angle. But now uh, this geometry is actually the same as a BTC geometry with a different, uh, well, radius, you might say. Indeed, I'm gonna rescale all these coordinates, which I have called R tilde, T tilde, and phi tilde by the same factor beta over two pi L, although here it's uh, the other way around. But in such a way that if you put all of these quantities uh, in here, the geometry becomes again BTZ. And now we have achieved uh, that phi is again periodic modulo two pi. Uh, as you can see, namely, if phi shifts uh, with two pi, um, I think I'm doing this wrong. Uh, it's wrong. Anyway, there's some factor here that I've, uh, I think that should be no two pi here. Anyway, sorry about that. Uh, anyway, there's some rescaling that, that allows you to put this uh, in here. I think the two pi should be uh, absent here, I think. No, oh, anyway, there's some factor there. But anyway, the, 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 the main story is indeed, the conclusion is that I can rescale the coordinates here so that it turns again to a BTC. But now notice that the periodicity in the, in the phi uh, actually translates into uh, the temperature actually of the of the BTC geometry. It pictures what you actually have done as you have first turned it into a cone, but then there's some rescaling that allows you to sort of flatten it out again, but actually at the cost of reducing the size of this uh, black hole horizon. Actually, it doesn't really make sense to draw a cone in here if it's a horizon anyway, because this picture doesn't extend inside the horizon. Um, the other story is the dimensional reduction. I mean, I, I said we have two parts of the, the geometry, one that became the CFT, the other part that became GT, JT gravity. Indeed, if you take the three-dimensional uh, Einstein action with cosmological constants and you put an ansatz, uh, kluze klein type ansatz of this form, where theta is some periodic angle, then uh, this action reduces exactly to uh, the action of JT gravity where the coordinate of the metric component that's multiplying the angular coordinate actually becomes the dilaton field. Actually, the, uh, the, you have to write phi squared here and then you get a phi in here. This was pointed out in a paper a long time ago by uh, Anna Achukaro and, and uh, Ortiz. Uh, they actually noted also that the, the black hole solutions in two dimensions and those in three dimensions are related uh, in the same way. And that actually is what we're gonna be using uh, also. Um, actually, already in the ADS vacuum, you can see a direct correspondence. If I write down the ADS uh, three geometry, I write it into two parts, uh, one which is the X plus X minus coordinates. And then there's a coordinate that I'm gonna reduce, uh, be reducing over, I call it Y here. Um, 
because uh, this is sort of like in, in uh, uh, Poincaré coordinates, where you think about this as a translation direction. But we actually going to assume it's a periodic in the sense we're going to take a finite part of this space and we're going to reduce the theory. But we can read off actually the fields already in uh, the, the two dimensional space. The metric uh, is just the same as this metric. But the five field, as I said, comes from the component of the metric in the other direction over which I've reduced. And indeed, if you look at this part of the geometry, it actually tells you exactly also what the, the, the JT Teleton should look like. And so the, the behavior like this one over x plus minus x minus is precisely also what's in, the, in this part of the geometry. And there's a relationship between the value of phi r, which is this parameter that multiplies the, the, the r dependent part in, in phi, uh, and uh, the angle or the distance over which I've done, made the reduction. So if I look at the space here, there's a certain distance uh, in the y direction that I'm traveling. And that distance phi r is actually precisely what appears in here. So this is uh, the other way of saying it. Actually, uh, there's a certain way that this distance depends on the distance from the boundary because of the, the, the scaling factor, the conformal factor here. So actually, the value of this phi minus phi zero field is precisely uh, the, the, the geodesic distance, or not, I should say, the actual uh, distance uh, between these two points. Um, so that's a way in which the geometry actually in, in three dimensions and, and the solution in the JT gravity are connected. This you can also do for BTC, uh, so for the finite temperature situation. So then uh, we can write the BTC geometry in this way by going to sort of Kruskal type uh, coordinates. There's the angle coordinate phi. And again, I split it into two parts, which is the part that also be, will be described in the geometry in the JD gravity. And then this part actually uh, translates into, again, the phi fields for uh, the JD diloton. And uh, in the geometry, we see the tan squared appearing, which is also exactly the, 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 the term of the factor we find in, in, the, in the solution for phi. So if we would do a dimensional reduction along this phi direction of the, the gravity theory on this sort of space, it would actually be uh, exactly, uh, well, consistent with the, the way we obtain the JT gravity. So in this uh, reduction, we're assuming that nothing depends on this angular coordinate. So the ansatz we take for the metric also should be phi independent, and then you can do the dimensional reduction. So this is the two parts of this, the, the problem. And so if you now put it together, uh, you can actually uh, take, uh, for instance, uh, the, the CFT part and the JT part. Here I do it for the extremal case. So that's like uh, just flat, uh, not flat, I mean, it's a Poincaré patch for ADS space. So here we have uh, a boundary. And uh, so I'm going to put actually the JT gravity not uh, on this continuation here. It's going to be at this this uh, region, this um, perpendicular uh, brain kind of configuration. So the space on which the, the gravity lift is this, this space. And this is where the CFT is living. And the interactions occur here. And now you can uh, ask a question about the entanglement. If I take a part of the, the CFT, then uh, I can ask uh, what is uh, the entanglement of that region. Then there will be contributions that have to do with uh, Rita Venagi services that also extend into the JT region. Actually, the JT contribution uh, is this expression. And in the island formula, we have two contributions, namely the gravity part and this, uh, this, the CFT part. And the CFT part is uh, clearly this part of the, the curve, while the gravity part uh, is exactly what gives you this uh, distance. I already told you that kind of is, is this phi r. So both sides are now uh, geometric and, and the minimization then has to do with sort of minimizing with respect to the location of this point. So this is the point A and you have to uh, find the location A for which this sum of those two terms uh, is minimal. Um, 
note I've written here the first part in terms of a Newton's constant and the second part in terms of a central charge. Uh, the two are related uh, in this very simple way. Uh, and this is because of the Brown and O formula and the way that the dimension reduction works. Uh, this you can also do now for the BTC geometry. Um, actually, uh, yeah, here I uh, indeed was going to ask this question again about the entanglement entropy. So now the CFT lives here on this green part, and the gravity part comes from uh, into, well reducing over this this blue region. Uh, this is before page time. Uh, then uh, the the Rito Kanyagi services go like this, uh, as is expected. So this is counting the uh, entanglement of the radiation and the black hole, but it's sort of by measuring a surface that's indeed going in between them. So clearly this is uh, what is called the trivial uh, reed hugging energy service in, in the Pennington discussion, but uh, here it actually has become geometrical as well. But now after page time, uh, we have again this other curve, uh, very similar to the other story I already showed, uh, except now indeed there is a, a gravity contribution that should be computed by uh, assuming that the geometry is uh, rotation invariant. I mean, this does not depend on the angle of phi. So our curve indeed sort of uh, follows this uh, circle or part of the circle. But then there is a, a geodesic uh, in, the, in the bulk. Again, there's a location here A that you have to minimize over. I've not indicated here. I mean, I've uh, not shown you the calculation in this part. Uh, we have done the formulas. Actually, I can show them on the next slide, I think. Uh, yeah, let me actually show that. Um, I think it's here, yeah. This is a cal calculation that uh, Evita has done. Uh, indeed, what we, what we have uh, calculated here is uh, the sum of the contributions from the CFT parts uh, together with the JT contour. Uh, or contribution. Uh, that part is of uh, the first term in here. And it turns out the, 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 the two contributions on both sides add up to a nice, well, kind of expression. It's similar actually to the results that were found by uh, Omiri and uh, Malasena uh, and, and their collaborators in that they had a, a, a slightly different expression. And then the reason, of course, is similar to what I explain, namely their uh, gravity theory is not uh, sort of located in this way. They have actually uh, uh, inclusion of uh, contributions of uh, CFT fields that live on the gravity side. And uh, I think actually, uh, as I said, we, we can discuss which part actually describes better the physics in this kind of situation. Eric, the parameter A is where it crosses and from the green to the gray region? It's that's right. Yes. Yeah. Yeah, so sorry. there's some. Yeah. So there's some parameter that that you can uh, use, but that, it has to have a particular value that minimizes this expression. Yeah, you're right. So it's this uh, region. This. Uh, Eric, I had another question. Uh, when you do this minimization, so the way I saw that at the beginning, the reduction of BTZ into JT gravity is just the usual ADS three um, throat. So AD, so BTZ has an ADS three region, and then it has an ADS two region. And if you look at the common D25 direction, for example, if you realize the BTC black hole is a near horizon of the D25 P uh, black hole, then the, the, the common D25 uh, the common D25 direction in ADS3 has a shrinking size. And then when you go to the ADS2 region, it has constant size. And then you can compactify on it officially and you obtain an ADS2. Uh, so you obtain the JT gravity on in the ADS2 region, and then it, it, it has a constant dilaton in the ADS2 part of the throat and a growing dilaton in the, in, in the ADS3 part of the throat. This is what, what I understood from the previous slide. However, here I'm a bit confused about this boundary being split into two and, I, I mean, and moreover in the extremal case, the other, the other question was, you know, in, in, in the extremal case, all this BTZ metric is supposed to cover the, out, uh, the outside of the horizon. It's not supposed to cover the region inside the horizon. So the islands, I'm confused where they are. Is the island inside the horizon or outside? I thought the island is supposed to be inside the horizon. In this case, it's actually, so the island in the air is actually the region in between, uh, well, on this side of the, the the red curve. And so in this case, it would be outside of the horizon. Outside of the horizon, okay. Yeah, so, but actually this is because I've sort of done a quasi-static calculation here. I've not included any dynamics of this sort. 
I mean, I expect that if this model is turned into a model for black hole evaporation, you would find a different uh, answer. But uh, I mean, we have not been able to do those calculations in, in the dynamical background. Uh, so this is just a calculation at a fixed time slice. And so uh, we, we have not uh, used uh, the time direction in this, this uh, calculation. Okay. Um, but I have to say that uh, another thing about uh, this is that uh, one um, intuition, actually also a motivation from this uh, picture, uh, comes from the what's called the long string phenomena. I mean, one way I think about uh, this geometry is actually that of the long string, um, and also the the way that uh, the evaporation may happen actually is that maybe some short strings are being emitted. But the, the heat path uh, consists then of, of well, the, the largest entropy state. So there's, maybe there's a way that even these models for black holes, like the D1, D5 system, if you think about radiation in some uh, near extremal case, uh, might be met on this kind of uh, model. Mm. Okay. Um, uh, a quick, a quick question about uh, about time evolution, which you said that you, you haven't considered. Is that is the idea to uh, let this parameter a just like change it by hand, and you know that it represents changing the mass of the black hole by the argument that you presented with flattening the cone? So, was the was the difficulty in just taking this expression and, and letting a? Uh, well, yeah. Well, one thing that needs to change is the angle here. Uh, I mean, in the sense that we want to make the radiation part bigger and the black hole is going to be smaller. Um, so that's a, a model I will write down. Actually, I will discuss a bit of that. Uh, the uh, calculation, of course, what it will, uh, it will affect the location then uh, of this, this curve if you would do it in some later time. So if I would change the angle here, of course, the curve will change. So we have a direct relationship between the opening angle here and right. the location that is this we know. So what we're going to model actually is, is the, the time dependence of this opening angle. Right. And, um, and as is also uh, expected, I mean, I'm going to use this mapping from the, the cone to the flat space in, in a bit to do that. OK, thanks. Um, Yes, any further questions? All right, let me then continue. Uh, actually, indeed, let me compare it. Uh, I mean, I already uh, said a bit about this. This is the expression that was found uh, in this paper. Uh, it has a slight difference in the sense that uh, their calculation, uh, the, the bath, the thermal bath and, and the uh, black hole geometry form actually together kind of a Minkowski type space where if you think about this distance, uh, this is just a straight line. And in our case, we had sort of a perpendicular rectangle uh, in between them. And this is actually gives us the, the different formula. Here you have just A plus B squared. If you look at our formula, we had A squared plus B squared. So it's kind of natural uh, because of, uh, well, Pythagoras kind of way, the distance is different. So the model is not exactly the same, uh, and maybe there's some physics behind it, but we have not fully uh, understood that. Uh, now I want to need get to sort of more dynamics, and the dynamics uh, should involve indeed uh, changing from before page time to after page time. So we want to understand why uh, this part becomes larger and, and the other part becomes smaller. And you can think about it uh, this way. So this is a part of the, the boundary. Um, they are emitting particles, uh, this quantum mechanical degrees of freedom. And once in a while, they also absorb a few. But if they emit more than they absorb, they will lose energy, the quantum mechanical degrees of freedom. Uh, they will also lose entropy. And the CFT will increase its entropy. And the entropy in this picture must be related to the size of this horizon uh, that's dual to the CFT. So if the entropy increases over time of the CFT, that also translates into this picture that the black hole horizon becomes larger in this region and the other way around. Actually, the total entropy stays constant uh, and also the total energy in this picture, actually. And, and the reason is that in this time coordinate that we have used here, 
the black hole uh, keeps its size, the total black hole. The only thing that changes is the way we're gonna split it up into two, two terms. But now I wanna get to, to some dynamics. And for that, I use uh, the, the dynamics in terms of the formulation in terms of the Schwarzschild boundary theory. Uh, here I can use work uh, that was done uh, a while ago. Um, first, before I get there, actually, uh, let me quickly review the Schwarzschild theory. I'm, I think it's kind of familiar for most of you. So I'll go do it, well, short. Uh, this is the BTC, sorry, the, the, the ADS geometry. Uh, the way to get to a dynamical boundary picture, which is kind of like this, is to uh, introduce uh, new coordinates u and v by making x plus and x minus functions of those. And then there's a dynamical boundary, uh, which in the uv coordinates is simply located at u equals v, but in x and pl plus and x minus coordinates, it has some different form. And that gives you some function tau that is my dynamical uh, boundary type. And actually, it's the dynamical variable of the, of the JT gravity. And then the action looks like the Schwarzschild. Actually, this is derived from looking at the Gibbons Hawking uh, action in the two dimensional theory. Uh, you may wonder how it gets, uh, how you get it from the three dimensional theory. Actually, that is something we've checked. I mean, there's a way that a Gibbons Hawking term in three dimensions also reduces down to uh, a Gibbons Hawking term in two dimensions. And then uh, with actually the phi field in there included. And then you can get to the, uh, the uh, Swatchen theory actually by assuming certain boundary conditions, of course. I mean, here we have assumed uh, a certain behavior of the field phi and um, the metric at infinity, but I'm not gonna go through all of that. I think it's sort of uh, well explained in the literature. Also this fact that there is a, a thermal state uh, given by this solution. This is the same function we saw appearing actually Indeed, that uh, also appeared in the BTC geometry. Uh, but anyway, this is the, the thermal state. Indeed, if you calculate the, the energy for this state, it's uh, constant and it uh, is expressed in the temperature like that. And the en energy is also actually given by the Swatch. Now, how do we get dynamics? Uh, we want to indeed now have the boundary interact with uh, the, the CFT and there's uh, particles being emitted and being absorbed uh, for this. We use a uh, formalism developed by uh, Engel, Sorry, Mettens, and, and Herman Galinde. They studied uh, this boundary dynamics in terms of the variable tau. Uh, as I said, this is the energy, but the energy doesn't stay constant because there's a, a flux of energy going out and, and flux of energy going in, uh, which are these components of a stress tensor on the boundary. And the difference between the flux out and in is of course the change in the, in the energy. So this is the equation. And now uh, you have to plug in this in here. And the other thing you use is that uh, the outgoing flux actually can be computed uh, purely from, uh, well, considerations using conformal uh, invariant sort of actually conformal anomaly. And it's given itself by the Schwarzschild. Now in the model that, that they considered, actually they assume perfect absorbing boundary conditions. So that means uh, there's nothing coming in. So that means that TVV was zero. And then the equation becomes quite simple because uh, basically the energy appears also on the right hand side and you find that the energy uh, decays um, exponentially. Uh, for the function tau of t, actually that became quite a complicated one. I mean, it's not so simple to write a solution for an equation where if I take the Schwarzschild derivative that you get an exponential function. Uh, but it, uh, it turns out actually in our case, uh, we should not even expect this uh, condition to hold because uh, we also expect we have a thermal state of the CFT that there will be some flux maybe of energy going in. And indeed uh, there is, uh, well, it's an ansatz that we sort of can motivate. Uh, and this is indeed where, where our uh, analysis is not fully complete yet. It's a constant determined by the central charge and it also involves the, uh, the ADS curvature. And there may be a free parameter here. Actually, the free parameter may be fixed by some arguments. Actually, I expected natural values actually one. Uh, but uh, I'll tell you later why, why it would be very nice to have a, a choice here, namely in the physics of the interaction of this model with the, with the CFT. The question indeed is, 
how absorptive is the boundary and maybe how even uh, well what's the strength of the interaction between the the, the, the quantum mechanics and the, and the cft if there are some parameter controlling it that might affect this uh, parameter in here anyway from the field equations it seems like uh, the most natural value as i said is one and i'll do this in the rest actually uh, so i write down here the equation of motion now with this additional term um, where uh, this is the energy term that is uh, changing over time this is the outgoing flux of energy of stress energy and this is some incoming flux which is a constant and this equation can be solved in a quite a nice way it looks very similar to the to the uh, the black hole solution which was a, a constant uh, swatch and derivative but now we're going to have it evolve in time uh, by taking this argument uh, to be a function of t again and that function is an exponential function if you insert this uh, into the swatch and derivative you will actually find that it satisfies this uh, equation for this you use just the, the familiar formulas uh, about how swatch and derivative can be computed for functions that are uh, functions of other functions i mean there's some uh, nice formulas that allow you to calculate this and verify indeed that this is the solution turns out that the mass indeed exponentially decays however it doesn't totally decay to zero there will be a minimum uh, value for the mass and i expect that this is because there is some equilibrium situation where the radiation and the, and the black hole uh, well there's a minimum size of the black hole uh, although the solution actually keeps evolving uh, it never actually gets to this minimum uh, but there is a, a certain finite amount of energy that cannot be radiated away with this uh, model. Um, so this is indeed what I wanted to show is that there's indeed some picture of what the uh, evolution looks like. Uh, actually, it can be formulated using the same rescaling that I did here. I did this rescaling for constant beta, which showed you that I can change the angle uh, in this way. So what you expect here indeed is that this angle changes in the sense that this black hole changes size, then that's remaining over it because the size of this other black hole actually is related to the angle in this direction. But now we want to make this dynamical. Actually, there's a very similar uh, substitution you can do. Now uh, I had coordinates T tilde and T here, and this is the equation. Uh, but now this is the equation I had before. And indeed, you can define a time dependent temperature now by uh, actually looking at this equation. Uh, there's if I differentiate t tilde with respect to t, I get 2 pi L over beta. This is exactly how I define my uh, time dependent temperature. And if I insert this expression, you get uh, this formula. You see indeed that the temperature actually also decays exponentially. So the temperature goes down as, as the black hole sort of radiates. Now, it would be very nice if we can derive such a model also from a more microscopic picture. Uh, this is kind of what I wanted to uh, get to the sort of conclusions. I'm not sure what I'm even doing now in time. Is there, uh, how much time do I have left? Uh, you've got another five minutes and but we let people run over so if you need a few more okay minutes. all right anyway i think i'm almost there i mean i have a few conclusions that that will take the five minutes uh, uh, let you, me uh you can um, have 10 if you need it no okay fine um uh, well uh, i'm just no sh sure people are tired after a full week so let me not stretch it too much let so anyway uh, this is a the sort of a concluding slide i mean i have uh, formulated a dynamical description uh, I mean, at least proposed now for how this black hole evaporation can be modeled, namely in terms of a, a point here that's sort of going to move. One thing that I should say is that uh, what that actually does is uh, it keeps the temperature and the energy kind of uh, constant, the total energy at least, and also the total entropy, but also the temperature. Uh, this is actually necessary in order to have uh, a change in energy uh, that's proportional to a change in entropy and both being uh, uh, well conserved. Uh, 
but this model actually has several time corners. I mean, uh, there's a time that uh, indeed is natural in this PTC geometry. And in that time, actually, this uh, motion happens uh, linearly in time. It sort of goes, uh, actually, you can expect that because in a certain way, the boundary conditions here are static because if you don't involve the rest of the geometry, then there's some constant flux uh, of energy being exchanged. Uh, there's another time, which is precisely this function tau of t. So the tau tilde time is actually the time in which it's linear. And the other time, it's actually exponential. One way you can see this, for instance, is that uh, if I would express the right-hand side in terms of tau tilde, you already see that it's, it's a linear function of tau tilde. So the temperature, for instance, would be a linear function of tau tilde uh, in, in, in uh, well, this temperature. Of course, you have to in, uh, introduce, also keep into account that uh, the times are different. It just means that also the definitions of energy will also have to be changed. And this is actually what you can verify that indeed then the energy changes precisely in this way that I described here. Uh, it sort of changes linearly in time. Uh, so this is a model that is very much uh, like what the page uh, model look like, namely I have one system, uh, the black hole, the BTC geometry uh, or whatever its dual microscope description is. And then I split it up into two parts and I just uh, evolved that. And then there's the page curve uh, kind of manifesting in here. And it's sort of in the sa same simple fashion as, as the qubit model that I had uh, in the beginning. Indeed, one way to think about uh, this change of this angle is that not the energy changes, but the coupling constant of the JT gravity model. Uh, because that is uh, this phi parameter that's related to this distance, that's the one that's changing. And one way to think about this physically is that there's indeed numbers of degrees of freedom that is changing. And that the degrees of freedom of the, 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 the boundary theory uh, quantum mechanics actually gets transferred into degrees of freedom of the, the CFT. And so uh, it's not just energy being radiated, you're really emitting the, the degrees of freedom. And that, that would be a way of sort of making a microscopic model out of this. So that indeed is a concluding remark. Can we find a, a, a microscopic model? Uh, in terms of the quantum mechanics and the CFT uh, that, that realizes this sort of geometrical picture. You would like to have it more manifestly unitary again and then indeed demonstrate uh, its relation with the geometry. Uh, one way this can be done is also relating it to these replica methods that have been discussed uh, yesterday. Um, and maybe even uh, there's some way that we understand even this time evolution that I just described. Then I want to have end with a little bit of a speculation. I mean, I feel that uh, the whole discussion about uh, black hole information paradox always talks about the black hole states and the radiation as if that's the entire world. I mean, there's much more in the universe than just radiation and black holes. And you may wonder whether we should add uh, something which is called the environment. I mean, the idealizations that we envisaging where we imagine that we can extract and collect, collect all the radiation and, and lose nothing uh, in terms of entanglement, I think is uh, a bit of a stretch. And I think in practice, we all know that we should include everything about the environment that it's entangled with. And maybe everything that went into the black hole was already entangled with other things. So the purity of a state of a black hole, and even uh, if you ask, can we really talk about this? I have a feeling that is uh, something we may have to reconsider. And for that, I actually go back to this picture I had before. I mean, uh, where I had this picture of say the black hole, the radiation, but maybe some third component, which we might call the environment. And the whole discussion of the page curve and uh, what about entanglement entropy and what its uh, information should actually be viewed in this picture. And this is sort of a conjecture I have is that the resolution of the black hole paradox actually requires including the environment. And just as an example of what might uh, change is, is this page curve. Actually, what I, uh, I'm going to tell you is something I picked up from a paper that I just found by Matt Fisser and uh, Alonso Serrano. 
they uh, emphasize that this notion of the page curve is very much based on the bipartite way of thinking about uh, the black hole and the radiation, because then the entanglement entropy can do this. But if you look at the um, information in the radiation, there's nothing coming out in the first part, and then suddenly it has to come out with twice the speed. Did you hear what you? So uh, was that a question? I don't know. The uh, other thing that uh, happens here is that the black hole actually also loses information quite quickly. If you add the environment, you have a very different curve and actually you have different quantities you have to compute. You have to do something with the, the mutual information in the black hole and the radiation. And then you find uh, that uh, there's actually a curve that goes like this, uh, which goes actually equally high as those two. And the sum of the three curves actually is always a constant. And that seems to be uh, sort of a, a situation that I think uh, at least uh, may be uh, relevant for future discussions. Anyway, this is something I wanted to end with just as a uh, food for thought. Thank you very much. Well, thank you very much, Eric. That was great. And so, um, thank you. Questions and uh, comments? Okay. No questions. <laughs> Let's. Uh, maybe I could uh, maybe re-ask my question. This is Samir here. Yeah. Yeah. So I was just trying to see where gravity effects start. So suppose I start with some bunch of brains at weak coupling, maybe you know, just a bunch of 10 brains and coupling is weak. Then they radiate more or less like a piece of coal, I guess we sort of assume. And then I, as I keep increasing the coupling, Suppose in your model something changed and uh, some quantum gravity effects or non-local effects, some, some, any new effects which you might you know, put in your own words, then start. Is there something like that in what you are seeing or would it be more like fuzzball? You know, it's basically a piece of coal. The coal gets more messy from a neutron star, white dwarf, you get a neutron star, you get to a string star, no real qualitative change. So I'm trying to see if you're going the way Juan went that in the end you would have a remnant which disconnects to a baby universe, or would it be more like a piece of coal like you get in the end in the first ball picture? Is there anything that you see from your pictures which would take you one way or the other? Well, okay, I'm gonna uh, reverse the question. Namely, uh, a piece of coal has an interior uh, and it has a, even, you can go all the way inside. While uh, you're telling me that first balls, uh, I when I go and, and meet them, I might hit something uh, near the horizon. Is that correct or not? So it's just like the piece of coal. If you reach the surface of the piece of coal, you start seeing the degrees of freedom and I would absolutely- No, but you're, the, I think you're actually telling me that there's, uh, that I cannot even go inside of it. Is right. there so when you reach the first ball, you will start exciting more of the stringy mess uh, when you but reach is the there a ball. geometry that's the inside of the first ball like there's the inside of a, a, a piece of coal? Uh, maybe I didn't quite understand the question. I mean, as you go into the piece of coal, there is stuff there, but it's not the vacuum. And similarly, in the first ball, there is stuff there, but it's not the vacuum. Uh, is, is that what you were asking? Well, okay, so now the question is, the region behind the horizon is not there in for first balls, am I right? Well, so just like the coal, since there never is a horizon, somehow the piece behind the horizon is not there. So the way I would put it as, if you draw the traditional diagram of a black hole, then the part inside the horizon is not there. But the reason is that there was no horizon. So just like a, you know, a white dwarf or something whose size was roughly 2M plus a few planets. So the, the radio... What would I say in that case in your language? Well, I still have trouble f thinking about the first balls as something like coal. Anyway, a lot of the, uh, the things I said have, uh, as I said at the beginning, just the basis in quantum information theory. And it doesn't really, really care about whether it's a black hole or not. It's when you start translating things to geometry uh, that that uh, the black hole picture becomes relevant. So what is um, um, the issue here is indeed the existence of anything behind the horizon. So those questions don't exist for pieces of coal. 
Okay. But there, so is there is actually, sorry? So there is a difference between the black hole and the cold. Well, I, I do think so, but I mean, the, the, the assumptions, well, one of the things we're trying to find out from the microscopic picture is what are the properties of the dynamical system describing a black hole that makes it appear like there's a space time and there is a horizon and all the dynamics going on. And then these questions about fast scramblers, uh, chaos, uh, all those properties that uh, we sort of suspect black holes should have and make them actually quite unique. Uh, are necessary to get the space time. So if you would make uh, something uh, that is not a black hole, but which has all of those properties, I think it would emulate a black hole and actually has many of its properties. So I don't see the uh, necessity of assuming something like gravity uh, in the, the way that we think about uh, the microscopic story, because most of this is about the dynamics of a quantum mechanical system which indeed has many special properties, but where gravity in itself as part of the dynamics need not be assumed. So maybe then I could just ask you about one property which this the black hole in your description would have. Would it have a semi-classical region around the horizon in any, in any approximation effective description which produces entangled pairs in these states zero, zero, plus one, one, or it doesn't? I mean, that for me sort of characterizes the fuzzballs versus the other model that people would use. So if I just look at pair production, am I getting something like a zero, zero plus one, one pairs being produced near the horizon or I'm not? So that it depends on who you ask, who the question is asked to. Okay. Uh, because I mean, the, if you ask an infalling observer or someone that's gonna look at the horizon, he may actually see those things appearing. The question is, is whether that information is really there for someone that is thinking about this same black hole uh, from afar uh, and has a different set of variables to think uh, to use. And so um, this is what the whole complementarity also is about. So a question of whether these things, these virtual particles are there is not a question that can be answered without specifying the observer that's uh, going to be testing this. Okay, thank you. It's, it's, it's not an absolute question with an absolute answer. Okay, thanks. Any further questions or follow up on this? I had a rather naive question about what this would look like if you started trying to do it with extremal BTZ. I know you touched on that at the beginning, but what would this pictures of islands and so forth look like in the extremal case? Um, there are these, I mean, certainly in the, in the static situation, uh, there, they were there and they, they were discussed in this paper I mentioned. Uh, the, um, this is this picture, wow. actually, yeah, I have not drawn the islands in here, but there is an island picture in the static. So this is the extremal case, but there's a very similar picture to this one uh, here as well. Um, so actually, maybe I should say this formula actually is the formula for the extremal case. Uh -huh. And if you solve for A by minimizing this expression, you will find a point in here where this island starts. Interesting. So, so you know, looking at this, I, you know, every time you show me an extremal BTZ, I'm tempted to think about the D1, D5 P system and, and the conformal field theory there. So doing this kind of thing in that context, I could imagine taking a segment of the, of the circle and keeping the D1, D5 P as a CFT and then try to freeze out the degrees of freedom on another segment of the circle. Could, could this actually be a realization of the sort of thing you're doing? Yeah, I, I do think that... Um... I see that email also wants to ask a question, but the um, uh, it's an interesting question whether the location of this uh, quantum extremal surface has any uh, well relationship between where you see sort of the first ball solutions also uh, while doing their stuff. Uh, I kind of expect that should happen, um, yeah. and it's based on the on the picture I had in the beginning, namely. Uh, if the radiation starts entangling with the first ball geometries themselves, 
they may be required uh, to describe what's going on in this region. And so there's some way that these islands have to do with um, also entanglement that's being built up. I mean, the islands appear uh, after page time. It's not something that's there when there's no entanglement. So you have to imagine also for these first world geometry something that has to do with uh, probing the, the geometry with particles that already have built up a certain entanglement with the outside or something like that. I mean, as I said, maybe it's a, a superposition of states that uh, is going to be relevant in this. I should let Emil ask his question. Yeah, yes. I wanted a clarification on, on what you just said. So um, if I'm thinking about extremal BTZ to connect with the sorts of things that Nick and friends do. That's a situation where the uh, the BTZ black hole is carrying momentum. So if I understand all your considerations in this talk were for non-rotating BTZ solutions, is that right? Yeah, actually you're right. I mean, uh, what I call extremal here is um, I would have said uh, zero mass BTZ. Zero, zero mass BTZ. Zero mass. Oh, thank you. Okay. So you would need to consider something where there's a net momentum flux in the CFT from one ADS boundary to the other. Yes, I, I have to tell you one thing is that I thought about even um, because of the swatching and if I want to generalize this to a three-dimensional theory that that the whole Banyadas type geometries have become relevant for this story. Also because there's some motion in the angular direction when I start uh, doing the dynamics. I'm also thinking maybe there's some way that angular momentum does play a role. Um, so I, 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 there may be a way that, that uh, this uh, more general solutions that are rotating have to play a role in this as well. Except that uh, the, anyway, the, 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 the story I told you about these new coordinates and so on is something that I uh, don't know how to uh, do for, the, for those situations. Okay. Okay. And uh, any other questions or comments? Well, let's thank Eric again. And I have one other person that I need to thank. Joseph has been in the background being what I call the Zoom master. He's the guy who's basically making all the Zoom work seamlessly. And all I get I have to do is push buttons to make it work. So I really want to thank Joseph for his work put in, in the background there, doing all, yeah. making all this thing come together. Sure. Thanks a lot. You know, thanks for everything. Yeah, and Nick, uh, the concept of this meeting was also very good, actually, and the way it was organized with the, the talks and the discussions. I like that a lot. Thank you. I, I yeah. think it worked. Thank out. you, Nick. Thanks. You're thanks welcome. Thanks. It's Joseph too. Uh, we both dreamed this up together. So. Um, okay, uh, Joseph. Uh, yeah. Thank you. Yeah. And thanks, Joseph. Yeah. Thanks, thanks for guys. Thank for making it, uh, the meeting so nice. You know. Yeah, yeah. it's been brilliant. I, you know. Uh, it's been really a joy. So thank you for everybody, to everybody, and hopefully we can do it all in person next year. Um, yes, with some yeah. nice French food. <laughs> Nick has a big ERC grant, so you know plenty of money. We got to <laughs> eat it. Actually, what we didn't eat this year, we could eat next year. Yes, the budget yeah. is there, so <laughs> have some really amazing French catering. You know, uh, if you guys come, we are really looking forward to having you. Anyway. Good. So thank you for doing everything. It's been really a joy this week. So it's been a great week.